a lone figure wearing a hooded cloak had emerged from the trees. He drew steadily nearer, walking with large, quick strides. Although his shoulders were hunched, he was still quite tall. Beneath his cloak, he seemed powerful as well as dangerous, like a wounded wolf on the prowl. Iron stamped the ground, then trotted over to me. I stroked his nose, but he whinnied nervously. One look in his great brown eyes revealed something most unusual for the great stallion. Fear. Again I studied the figure, large under the cloak, drawing steadily nearer. Who was this that Iron would react so strangely? I could discern, under the hood, a man with a thick black beard, the hairs sprouted, it seemed, from a face as stern as chiseled stone. He glared at us with intense black eyes, his jaw etched in a permanent frown. As he reached the other side of the rivulet flowing out of the forest, the man halted. Sharply, he threw back his hood, so we could not mistake his identity. Yet I already knew him well. Here... Standing before me was the person I most despised, the person whose name had brought nothing but agony to the land he once ruled. Stangmar. I grabbed the hilt of my sword. Boldly, I stepped forward to meet him. So, growled the deep voice, you would slay me without a thought. My teeth ground together. No. That would reduce me to your equal. Stengmar's massive hand curled into a fist. You destroyed all I once had, boy. All. I have a long line of ancestors, too many to name, who ruled this isle before me. Yet none of them was ever toppled by his own son. None of them ever tried to murder his own son. He merely glared at me. After a moment, he spoke again his voice grim. Our wretched history does not concern me now. I seek not you, but someone else. Behind me, I heard Rhea draw a sharp breath. How did you find us? I demanded. The stallion's tracks, of course. Think you I don't know my own horse? He still bears that slice in his forehoof from our first battle. Iron neighed, stamping the tear forcefully. I glanced over my shoulder at him. The look in his eyes had changed to defiance. You, boy, have stood in my way at every turn, Stengma said icily. You have stolen my very realm, my castle, my soldiers, my servants. But you shall not stand in my way this time. His voice snarled like an angry beast. Tell me where Alain is now. I held myself as straight as my hemlock staff. You shall not harm her. Tell me where she is. Never. Stangmar's whole frame quaked with rage. Then, drawing a prolonged breath, he seemed to gain control of himself. She left me, boy, left me without a word or a letter before I had any chance to. He pounded his fist into his palm as his wrath suddenly returned. Why should I tell you this? I must find her. That's all you need to know, and I am certain you know where she is. He slammed his foot on the rivulet's bank, cracking off a slab of ice. Now tell me. So you can kill her, I shot back. She knows perfectly well what you would have done to her if she hadn't left. The same as you tried to do to me. He released a low growl. A spark from our cooking fire landed on the shoulder of his cloak and faded swiftly away. Hear me out. I don't want to harm her. I never wanted that. Oh, no, I scoffed. I speak the truth, he bellowed. I only want to speak to her, to tell her something. This was more than I could bear. 
You only want to murder her. Vigorously, he shook his head. You don't understand, boy. I... Well, I... I... Awkwardly, he waved one of his powerful arms, as if trying to seize the words he needed. You see, I... I... Love her. Dumbstruck, I rocked back on my heels. You expect me to believe such madness? No, he grumbled, his voice quiet, almost tender. I had just hoped you might listen. You, who look so very much like I did at your age. I stiffened, my mind reeling at the very notion that I shared anything at all with this man. Leave us, I spat, and cease your searching. You shall never find Elen. Never. His face hardened again. That we shall see, boy. A hint of a smirk touched his lips. Just as you shall see how Rita Gower deals with his foes. My scarred cheeks throbbed. In my mind echoed Dogda's warning. To prevail on winter's longest night, you will need to defeat your greatest foe. Nothing less. That meant Rita Gower, to be sure. Yet Stangmar filled me somehow with deeper wrath. Rhea stepped toward him, standing shoulder to shoulder with me. Forcefully, she declared, He's right. You'll never find her. Oh, scoffed Stangmar. And who are you, vine-clad girl, to tell me what I shall or shall not do? Resolutely, she studied him for several seconds. I am her daughter, she said at last. Her daughter and yours. For an instant... His harsh face softened ever so slightly. He returned her gaze, eyeing her with more curiosity than scorn. Despite myself, I found myself thinking he looked almost feeling, almost handsome. His clenched fist slowly relaxed and dropped to his side. The daughter we lost, he asked stiffly. Long ago, in the forest. Yes, the daughter you named Rhiannon. Seeing his look of disbelief, she went on. The trees raised me, took care of me. But down inside, I never forgot about my true parents, and always wondered if I'd see you again. From her belt, she took the orb of fire, as she held it before her, a glimmer of orange sparked within its depths. Lit by the globe in her hand, as well as the glow of the rising sun, her face radiated. It seemed to shine from another source as well, a source that could not be seen. Once you possessed this orb, she said softly. You called it one of your treasures. Did you learn how to tap its powers? Stangmar, still watching her intently, said nothing. It can heal a broken spirit, she went on, stepping a little closer. I shot her a worried glance, but she ignored me. Here now, take it. Use it for yourself. Hesitantly, his fingers stirred as if they were deciding what to do. Then his hand lifted, and his whole arm he reached toward the glowing sphere. Please, she implored, use it to restore the man you once were. Suddenly, Stangmar's face went rigid again, his mouth pinched with pride. With a sharp swipe of his hand, he struck the orb, sending it hurtling over the fire coals. It struck the weathered trunk of the oak and burst into thousands of shards, a flash of orange light exploded, hovered in the air for an instant, then faded away into nothingness. Utterly speechless, Rhea stared at the shards, 
sprinkled across the oak's burly roots. Lou darted to her side, as did Scully Rumpus. They stood in silence, gawking at the remains of the orb of fire. I pounded my staff on the ground. You destroyed it! Just as you, boy, destroyed my realm, I curse the day that woman ever brought you back to this isle. With that, he took a stride toward Ion. The great stallion's tail swished sharply, and his ears angled back. He reared, chopping at the air with his hooves, before galloping some distance away. Shaking his mane, he stood with his head high, black coat glistening in the early morning sun. All right, then, Stagmar grumbled. The horse shall be yours. His frown deepened. But the final victory shall be mine. From his pocket, he hurled something into the coals of the fire. A sudden burst of smoke, thick and dark, erupted. Like a heavy blanket, it enveloped us, choking our throats and searing our eyes, tongues and nostrils. Coughing violently, tears pouring down our cheeks, we stumbled away from the smoke. At length, our coughs subsided. The smoke dissipated, and we started to breathe normally again. Ion whinnied and trotted over to my side. He butted me with his nose, and I stroked his long jaw. Then I looked around. Stangmar had vanished, along with Coella. She's gone, I fumed. The mare is gone. She's not all that's gone. Somberly, Rhea kicked at a few shards, all that was left of the orb. Hoarsely, she whispered, I never did learn how to use it. I gave her a hug, hoping to comfort her. It's not your fault. It is, she said sadly. I should never have shown it to him. Thoughtfully, she pursed her lips. Even so, do you know what's strange? I've dropped it before, even fallen on it once or twice. But it never broke, or even cracked. It's almost like, well, like it was ready to break just now. I touched the place on her belt where the globe had ridden for so long. Wish I could bring it back for you, I confessed. But if there's any magic that can do that, I don't know it. She swallowed. For a moment there, I really thought he'd use it to heal himself. I squeezed my staff. To heal that man would take more magic than the orb ever had. Scully Rumpus trudged over to the shards, chattering to himself in disbelief. For a moment he pawed through the pieces, working his way among the twisted roots. Finally he quit, apparently convinced that the treasure had truly been destroyed. Ears drooping, he returned to Rhea and climbed up to her shoulder. Gently... He wrapped himself around her neck, embracing her like a collar of fur. "'We've got to warn Mother,' I declared. "'She has to stay where we left her, in that little village. "'It's about the last place Stangmar would think to look for her.' "'You heard her, though,' Rhea countered. "'She'll be leaving there tomorrow. "'Then we'll have to get word to her today.' I scratched my chin. "'And there's another problem.' Stangmar might try to follow you or me, so it shouldn't be one of us who warns her. In unison, we turned toward Lou. I sank to my knees to face him. Could you do it, lad? Could you run back to the village today? Uneasily, he tugged on his sandy hair. I could do it, Master Merlin, if you need it done. His gaze fell. Truly, though, I don't really want to. Please, I implored. It's to help Elaine, the good woman who took care of you. Slowly, he nodded. Now, you must get there before nightfall, and you must tell her to stay in that same village until we come for her. All right? Yes, Master Merlin. I gave him a hug, patting his small back. Thanks, lad. Now... Have yourself a drink from the rivulet before you set off. As he stepped over to the bank, 
I rose and fetched the woolen scarf from the moss where he'd slept. Oh, Lou, I called. Don't forget this. He looked up from the water's edge, his face dripping wet. Seeing the scarf, he beamed. He padded back over to me and stood still as I wrapped it around his small neck. There, I pronounced, giving him another hug. On your way now. Oh, and Lou. Yes, Master Merlin. I gazed at his muddy brown eyes. You be careful. He lingered a few more seconds, his tongue working inside his mouth as if he longed to say something. But no words came. Hesitantly, he turned and started running south across the stubbly grass of the plains. For a while I watched him, then felt Rhea push something under my arm. It was the vest, its woven astral flowers aglow in the sunlight. You'll be needing that, she declared. So will you, I objected. You should keep it. She shook her head. No, no, Mother gave it to you, and besides, it's only fair, since I'll be taking your horse. My eyebrows jumped in surprise. She glanced over at Ion, who was walking toward the old oak. The muscles of his legs and back gleamed darkly, rippling as he moved. That's right, isn't it? Of course, I agreed. You'll have more ground to cover and more need for speed. With a grin, I added, It just always amazes me when you have my ideas before I do. She grinned back. They're usually your best ideas there. Too true. She took my hand. Where will you start to look for that warrior? In that village to the north, the one the old fellow mentioned. What was it? Yes, Care Dalek. I inhaled the crisp morning air and blew out a frosted breath. If that sword arms character is truly searching for me, it won't be long until I find him. I only hope it's before he's harmed anyone else. Rhea curled her forefinger around my own. Find him, Merlin. Do what you must to stop him. Then meet me at the Circle of Stones. Don't fail me, all right? I won't fail, I promised. Fixing her with my gaze, I declared, Nor will you. One last time I studied her face. So sensitive and aware, and yet, at the same time, so bold and unpredictable. Ride well now. Ride as if you had wings. Chapter 14 Snowfall Snow came suddenly. Even as Rhea and I parted, the sun vanished behind a thick mesh of clouds, and the first flakes began falling. Large and unwieldy, they drifted down relentlessly, coating the upper limbs of the oak and filling the deep grooves of its trunk. In a moment's time, the tree's twisted roots became nothing more than ridges of white upon the ground. I tramped northward, keeping just outside the edge of the forest, in the hope that less snow would accumulate at the base of the trees. I knew from experience the difficulties, and dangers, of trekking through drifts out on the open plains, Though I seemed to be heading into the worst of the storm, I worried about Lou, travelling south across unprotected grassland. Would he lose his bearings and all that whiteness? How long would his bare feet last in an onslaught of snow? Just ahead of me, a hemlock bough snapped, releasing a cloud of shimmering white crystals and dumping a mound on the ground. As I stepped across, my boots crunched on the frozen mass and my thoughts turned to another set of worries. Where to find this sword-armed warrior? Clearly he expected me to seek him out, which was why he'd announced his challenge to the old man, and no doubt to others. What if, by the time I reached Care Dalek, he'd already left, or maybe he hadn't intended to stop there at all, just to pass by on his way to the rising plateaus farther north, home to Urnalda and her dwarves? The mere thought of Urnalda chilled me deeper than the frosted air. As much as I wanted the dwarves to join Finkaira's ranks at the Circle of Stones, 
I hoped that Rhea wouldn't have to deal with their treacherous enchantress. She would have more than enough difficulties already in trying to win over the Canyon Eagles and the others. Snowflakes continued pouring down as I reached the end of the trees. The instant I left their cover and started tramping across the exposed plains, a biting wind struck, piercing even my thickly padded vest. Before me, the land had already transformed from rusty brown dappled with grey to a uniform blanket of white. Drifts gathered, lifting above the ground like a succession of frozen waves. The wind howled fiercely, freezing my fingers to my staff. Meanwhile, the frosty clouds of my breath froze the skin of my cheeks as well as the stubbly hairs on my chin. I wished, as I had often before, that I could grow a beard. Yes, a great thick one that could shield my face from such a storm. How could I battle anyone in such conditions? No matter. I would find that warrior, that murderer of children, wherever he was, and put an end to his brutal attacks. Forever. Spying a gnarled apple tree, so old that several of its snow-covered branches drooped down to the ground, I decided to seek a moment's shelter from the wind. As I approached, I noticed a small glint of rusty red on a higher branch, an apple, shriveled and dry, but possibly edible. Climbing under the boughs, I knocked it loose with my staff, sat down, and took a small bite. Tough it was, and bored out by worms, but a hint of tart apple flavour burst in my mouth, reminding me of the fragrant spring that now seemed so far away. Apple blossoms, new green leaves, fresh blue gentians, tiny strawberries exploding with sweetness. How long had it been? Legs crossed, I gnawed on the fruit, wondering whether springtime would ever come again to this landscape. For now, the world was filling up with snow. When I finished the meagre apple, I discarded the core. It landed on the head of my shadow, barely visible on the ground through the shadows of the interlaced boughs. Easily miffed as ever, my shadow gathered itself and flung the core back at me, barely missing my nose. Oh, do behave, I scolded. My nose may be large, but it's not a target. The shadow placed its hands on its hips, rocking its head back and forth as it scolded me in return. All right, then, I apologize. I shook my own head. Sometimes, though, I wonder how I ever endure you. Really, you can be as testy as... Well, as... I caught myself, grinning guiltily. There's me. As the shadow shook with justifiable mirth, I reached for my leather satchel. From its pouch I pulled out the feather from Trouble's wing. Twirling it slowly between my thumb and forefinger, I tried to imagine what his life was like in the other world of the spirits. Surely he soared and swooped and dived for hours in that world of mist, as he had once loved to do in this world. Did he fly at Dogda's side, perhaps, or wherever the winds chanced to take him? And who did he screech at in his regular fits of rage or passion, now that I was no longer by his side? Giant's bones, how I missed him. Wistfully, I put the feather back in the pouch. Then, despite the howling wind, I ducked under the branches and stepped out into the snow. Grateful more than ever for my mother's vest, I pushed through a mounting drift. For a brief moment, I paused, gazing back at the tree, knowing someone must have planted it long ago. That had been an act of faith in the future, in the children who would one day reap its harvest. Grimly, I slid my staff under my belt and set off. Tucking my hands under my armpits for warmth, I trudged through the gathering snow. My best chance to find the village I knew was to stay alert for any signs of water, a stream, a tarn, or a branch of the river unceasing. Guessing at the sun's position behind the clouds wasn't easy, but I did my best to keep myself on a northerly bearing— Otherwise, in this swirling storm, I could easily spend the rest of the day roving in circles. Snow matted my hair, 
and slid down the back of my neck into my tunic, but I paid no heed. What mattered now was finding sword arms. Before long, my toes grew stiff and numb from the cold. Slender icicles started to dangle from the hair over my ears. Still, I pressed on. Suddenly, I stepped into a hip-deep hole. Face first, I toppled forward, taking a mouthful of snow. Flailing about to extract myself, I noticed a subtle line of depression at the edge of the deeper snow. A stream! I had unwittingly stepped right off the bank. As I clambered back onto the higher ground, wiping the snow off my face, I began following the path of the stream. After a while, it grew noticeably wider, so that the snow didn't fill the whole channel. At the same time, the storm itself began to slacken. The flakes became sparser, and the wind blew less fiercely. Then I smelled smoke. Whether it came from a single cooking fire or a multitude of hearths, I had no idea, but I pushed onward, staying with the root of the stream. In time, I noticed a faint grey haze in the distance. As the snow lightened further, I spied the outline of a thatched roof, and then another, and another. It was, indeed, a village. It consisted of more than a score of homes, sturdier and tidier than the huts of Ker Aranon. I saw pens for sheep, goats, and chickens, some of which were already venturing out of their shelters and gambling in the snow. Many of the houses had porches and window boxes, and a few offered swinging seats for relaxation. Beyond doubt, this was one of the prosperous farming communities at the southern border of the dwarves' realm. But was it Care Dalek? I approached the common, a wide square between several of the largest houses, including one that held a blacksmith's forge. Suddenly, I heard a sound that struck me with dread. A wailing child! I spun around to find the source. There, to my relief, stood a mother on her porch, taking off her child's leggings, which were soaking wet from snow. The child, shrieking miserably, looked red-faced and teary, but otherwise quite unharmed. At that moment, a gruff voice addressed me. "'What's your business, stranger?' Turning around, I faced a stocky, dark-haired man with a ruddy complexion. In one hand he held a spear, though he held it upright like a staff. Seeing its gleaming tip, I felt relieved it wasn't pointed at me. Not yet, at any rate. "'Well?' he barked, eyeing me suspiciously. "'Is this Care Dalek?' I asked. First, tell me your business. My business is yours as well, I replied, brushing some snow off the sleeve of my tunic. I need to know if you've seen any signs of a warrior with no arms but sword blades instead. The man raised his dark eyebrows, his face twisted. For an instant he looked as if he were going to be ill. Then, all at once, he released a huge guffaw, he began laughing raucously. <laughs> a warrior, you say, without arms? <laughs> he slapped his thigh. <laughs> That's a precious one. <laughs> I scowled at him, wiping some snow off my tunic collar. It's no laughing matter. He has swords instead of arms. He's a murderer, a maimer of children. Again the burly fellow slapped himself in mirth. A great lot of ha, ha, harm he can do without any arms. <laughs> I speak truth. Then your truth <laughs> is precious funny. Not at all, I countered, my rage rising. Don't you understand? Every orphan, every child is in danger. Have you no heart, man? Yeah, yeah, he replied with a chortle. And I also have arms. He fell again into hysterics. <laughs> That's precious. Arms. Heart. <laughs> My patience gone, I pointed at the head of his spear, carved from black obsidian. No doubt you'll think it funny, too, when Rita Gower attacks this village and skewers you with that very spear. The man's face grew suddenly stern. Now you're no longer funny. He lowered the spear, 
pointing it squarely at my chest. And no longer welcome. Who are you to turn me away? I demanded. I need to speak with your village elders, whoever is in charge, someone with a grain of sense in his head. His arms flexed as he squeezed the spear. I am Lid, guardian of Care Dalek. He jabbed the spear, grazing my tunic. And I'm telling you to leave. Despite the fact that my fraying garb and snow-matted hair made me look more like a vagabond than a wizard, I replied, And I am the one called Merlin. I command you to take me to your elders. His face flushed. Merlin, is it? You think you can pass yourself off as a mighty wizard just by stealing his name? Why, stories have it the real Merlin can dispatch a troop of goblins with not more than a flick of the wrist. He pushed the spear point closer until it pressed against my ribs. Why, you're just a beggar, an insulting jester. Be gone, I say, or your blood will paint the snows of this common. Grinding my teeth, I stared straight at him. Not my blood, but yours. With a flick of my wrist, I sent a bolt of blue fire into the head of his spear. He shouted, leapt backward, and dropped the weapon. Aghast, he watched as the obsidian point melted completely away, sizzling on the snow. A moment later, all that remained was a splotch of black on the white-coated ground. He lifted his head, his eyes filled now with terror. So, you really are? Merlin, now tell me, are there any orphan children about? He opened his mouth, then closed it tight. He started to back away, one step, then another. I raised my hand to stop him, and he turned and bolted off, his boots pounding in the snow. Come back, I called. He kept running, disappearing behind the blacksmith's house. In frustration, I looked down at my shadow. Drat! He may be a terrible guardian, but I'm even worse as a wizard. The shape on the snow waved its arms at me. Try again. I sucked in my breath, then nodded slowly. Yes. Yes, you're right. I'll look for someone else, and hope to fare better this time. Seeing no one else about, I walked across the common to one of the larger houses. As I ascended its porch steps, I heard someone's feet scurrying inside. A child called out, It's a stranger, Mama. Looks like a beggar. Grimacing, I rapped on the door. No one answered. Again I tried, with no more success. Angrily, I stamped my boot on the porch and left. At the next house... The door at least opened, before it slammed in my face. Seething with frustration, I strode back to the common. I paced around, wondering which house to try next. A sudden, shrill scream pierced the air, stopping me in my tracks. Another child with wet leggings? But no, there was something different, painfully different, about this cry. Again it came, from somewhere behind the thatched shed in the goat's pen. Grabbing the hilt of my sword, I dashed toward the pen and leapt over the snow-covered railing. I rounded the corner of the shed. There, on the straw beneath the overhanging roof, huddled a small, disheveled boy, squealing piteously, standing with one foot on the child's forearm, ready to slice off his hand, was a massive, square-shouldered figure. Beneath those shoulders, where arms should have been, hung a pair of wide, gleaming swords. Chapter 15 Slayer Halt! I commanded. Release that boy! With a flash of light on his deathly blades, the warrior kicked his prey aside, spraying straw in all directions. The small boy crawled, whimpering, deeper into the shed, trying to hide behind one of the goats. At the same time, his attacker whirled around. Seeing me, he stepped boldly into the center of the pen, his boot prints blackening the fresh-fallen snow. He faced me squarely, looking the very essence of brutality. 
he stood a full head taller than most men, with plated armour on his broad shoulders and chest. A mask, fitted with the skull of a man, covered his face, and at his sides hung a pair of heavy, double-edged swords. So, he bellowed, the cowardly whelp of a wizard hides no more. You are the coward, I shot back. You who hunts down innocent children. He glowered at me, his weapons twitching. I have my reasons, sweet death of Dogda, I do. My hand, starting to draw my own sword, hesitated. Something about the warrior's voice struck me strangely. Had I heard it somewhere before, or dreamed it, perhaps? That must be it. Another one of my dreams come hauntingly true. What is your name? I demanded, planting my feet as best I could on the slippery snow. And why should I not strike you down here and now? The massive man took another stride toward me. Call me Slayer, came the voice from behind the skull. For that is how you shall know me. With a roar, he rushed at me swiping both his blades at my chest. I had barely enough time to draw my sword, which rang in the air. Suddenly, with a flash of metal, the angle of his blades changed. They were coming at my knees. Just a fraction of an instant before they sliced into me, I leapt backward, barely avoiding them. Seeing me land off balance, he charged at me with surprising speed. His hefty shoulder crashed into my side, sending me sprawling into the railing. Snow and bits of straw flew across the pen. I rolled away as his blades bit into the wooden rail, which splintered from the force. Quickly, I pulled my staff out of my belt. Now I held two weapons as he did. Again he bore down on me, this time swinging for my head. I ducked as his blades passed over. So close, I felt the whoosh of air just above my ear. Both of his swords slammed into the top of my staff. Though the reverberations from the blow jangled me down to my ankles, the staff held firm, sending off a blaze of blue sparks. Taken aback, he retreated a step, which gave me time to move away. Aha, I thought, this staff is made from more than wood, just as I am made from more than muscle and bone. Magic! That's the way to quash him! And while my staff's magic remained unpredictable even for me, I possessed plenty more magic that I could control and use. Spinning on my heels, I flung a powerful spell at his swords. Grow heavy, too heavy to lift. At once, streaks of black flowed down from his shoulders, wrapping around his blades like dark webs. In an instant, both swords were swathed completely in black. Slayer staggered, as if struck by some invisible blow. He started to raise his weapons again, but faltered, straining mightily to hold them aloft. At last, he doubled over from the weight as his blades crashed to the ground. Outraged, he roared aloud, straining to lift them, but they wouldn't budge. I started to gloat when I felt a strange sensation in the hand holding my own sword. To my shock, black threads poured out of the hilt, encircling the entire blade. Suddenly it felt heavy, too heavy to hold. Despite my efforts, it slammed down in the snow. Hard as I tried, I could not lift it again. The same spell. He's thrown it at me. Or had I just aimed my own spell poorly? In either case, all our blades were now useless. Urgently, I recited the counterspell, crafted to unwind the enchantment's power. It took several seconds, owing to its complexity in both words and tones, and I took extra care to aim it exclusively at my own sword. At the instant I finished, the dark web withdrew, melting back into the hilt. My sword moved freely again. I lifted it, swinging it over my head with a shout. An equally fierce shout came from my foe. He, too, had used the counterspell. I felt a rush of awe, tinged with fear, that he knew such intricate magic. Who could he be to possess such power? Just then he hurled himself at me again, slashing his weapons wildly. 
I had no time to think. All I could do was block his strikes with my upraised staff. Sparks sizzled in the air. He beat at me ceaselessly, giving me no chance to return the attack. My arms ached from fending off his blows. Harder he pressed, and harder. All at once I realized his plan. He was backing me into the shed. In a few seconds I would be cornered, unable to maneuver. The shed's wall loomed on one side, the railing on the other. I must get out of here. Another enchantment? Yes, one that would buy me a little time, enough to devise a plan of my own. My mind whirled, even as my elbow jammed against the wooden wall. Dodging a thrust, I threw myself to the ground. As soon as my hands hit the ground, I knew what to do. Lunging forward, not just with my feet, but also with my hands, I felt new power coursing through my limbs. With a surge of strength, I leapt as high as I could. Slayer's blade sliced through the air, barely missing the tan-coated back of the stag who bounded over the railing to safety. Sleek and strong, I ran across the common, my hooves pounding over the snow. Finally, I turned my antlered head around. I expected to see my attacker staring at me, bewildered from behind the goat's pen. Instead, a blur of brown came rushing at me. Another stag! How could that be? I jumped out of the way, but not before a sharp point of his antlers ripped into my flank. A wrenching pain twisted through my hindquarters. Blood streamed down my leg. With great effort, I bounded away. Across the whitened ground we tore, my pursuer gaining on me with every stride. I veered sharply, leaping onto the porch of one of the houses, but the stag followed me. Hooves clattering, we ran down its length. Despite the deepening pain in my leg, I managed to jump just high enough to clear the row of snow-filled flower boxes on the far end. When I landed again on the common, my injured leg buckled under me. My belly skidded over the cold snow. But I wheeled myself to stand again, scrambling out of the way, just as the other stag ploughed through the spot. Off I raced, swerving into the blacksmith's forge. I careened, and my flashing hooves knocked over the bellows. Down it crashed, sending up clouds of soot and ash. My eyes burned, my leg throbbed, but I dashed through the dark clouds and out again into the snow. As I hurtled across the common, the other stag grew close enough that I could hear his heaving breaths. His antlers grazed my wounded leg again. Around one house and behind another I ran, trying my best to evade him, but none of my maneuvers worked. I was tiring rapidly. I needed something to hide behind, even for a moment. Seeing an old wooden wagon tilting from a broken wheel, I dashed toward it and threw all of my strength into a desperate leap. If only I could clear it! But no! My foreleg struck the wagon's side, pitching me out of control. I slammed with a thud into the wooden bed, splintering the planks under my weight. Spinning helplessly, I slid through the snow. When I came to rest at last, I was no longer a stag, but a man. My left thigh ached terribly. My legging was torn and bloody. The other stag bounded around the wreckage of the wagon. As I watched in horror, he metamorphosed, changing into the sword-armed warrior. So, he too knew the magic of the deer. Chortling with satisfaction, he stepped toward me, raising his gleaming swords to slay me at last. I tried to stand, but collapsed weakly. My sword and staff left behind in the goat's pen could not help me now. Desperately, I wriggled backward through the snow, even as Slayer's shadow fell over my own. My shadow? Perhaps it could do something. But no, I, I needed something stronger than that, much stronger, something as powerful as the wind itself. Yes, that was it! Even as the deadly blades flashed in the air above my chest, I hurriedly whispered the incantation to summon a windstorm, taught to me by Ayla herself. And I finished with the plea, Blow him far from here, O tempest, far away from here! 
A sudden gust shrieked through the village, blowing over chairs and tools and water jugs. Doors flew open. A pair of wooden shutters pulled off from a window and sailed away. Cloaks and sticks and snowflakes swirled in the air, lifting off like so many flocks of birds. No! bellowed the warrior as the wind threw him backward, then carried him up into the air. No! He flailed and struggled, cursing at the unseen enemy that had borne him aloft. Then, as he flew over the nearest row of houses, a new gust whipped through the village. Ferociously it blew, in the opposite direction. Despite my efforts to cling to the corner post of someone's porch, I myself was lifted high above the ground. In the swirl of debris, I caught a glimpse of my sword and staff, also airborne. Through the air I tumbled, rolling and spinning, helpless to stop myself. Winds screamed above and below me. They would cease, I knew, only when they had finally run their course. This spell had a life of its own. How, I wondered, could Slayer have known the incantation? His own magic was strong indeed, far too strong to be used for such evil. Yet how could I possibly stop him when his powers so fully rivaled my own? Turning over and over, I sailed through the air, unable even to grasp my wounded leg. I whirled past the edge of the village, then over trees bare of leaves, and fields whitened from snow. Weak and disoriented, I didn't notice the winds starting to fade, nor did I notice the rocky plateau drawing closer and closer beneath me. With a resounding thud, I hit the ground. Over the flat stones I rolled, at last coming to a halt. Yet the world continued spinning as it grew steadily darker. Before I lost consciousness, though, I felt something hard and pointed jab my ribs. It might have been a rock, or the head of a spear. Chapter 16 The Question I awoke. Darkness shrouded me, though not the darkness of night. Cold, hard stone pressed against my back. Was this the rocky plateau where I'd landed? No. No, the air smelled different somehow, dank and stale, with the slightest hint of something I knew I'd smelled before. What, though? Fingers spread wide, I touched the flat stone beneath me. To my surprise, I felt the subtle grooves and ridges made by stone chisels, expertly wielded. So, this was a tunnel, or a room underground. Reaching out with my second sight, I detected a wall rising steeply beside me, and another on the opposite side. On each, a clasp of wrought iron had been placed to hold a torch, now extinguished, but at a height too low for a man or a woman. All at once, I knew the smell. Beard hairs, dense and tangled, and I knew this place, this underground realm, and those who had made it. Dwarves! I sat up, half-dazed. Suddenly I realized my leg didn't hurt any more. How could that be? My hand needed the muscles of my thigh. No pain whatsoever. And no scar! My leggings were no longer torn, having been mended with heavy, rough thread. At that instant, the torches sizzled, sputtered, and flared into bright light, illuminating the entire room. Alas, I saw no sign of my missing staff or sword. Like my gaze, my shadow swept around the room, searching for any sign of them. But the surrounding walls were utterly bare, broken only by a single cast-iron door opposite me. It had been etched with intricate designs of dwarves laboring to carve stone, set jewels, and shape metal. Just then I heard the sound of boots clomping toward the door's other side. The heavy latch lifted. As the door swung open, a pair of stout dwarves marched in. 
Each of them stood to one side of the passage, crossing their burly arms that had been painted with strange symbols. Although they stood only as high as the middle of my chest, they would prove more than a match for most men. They stared at me with eyes like molten iron. Behind their beards, thick and black, their jaws clenched firmly. An assortment of weapons dangled from their bodies, including jeweled daggers, double-sided axes, and sturdy oaken bows with quivers full of arrows. With their feet firmly planted, they seemed as solid as the stone floor beneath me. Then, through the doorway, strode a bizarre yet regal figure, wearing a purple robe adorned with silver runes and geometric designs. In one hand she held a wooden staff, weathered and blackened with age. In her other she bore the remains of some sort of fruit pastry which she crammed into her mouth and chewed avidly. Her brow glistened with a finely wrought band of jewels, mostly sapphires, though her unruly red hair sat like a thornbush on her head. Urnalda, enchantress of the dwarves, stood before me, her earrings of dangling shells clinking as she chewed. Seeing her again made my stomach churn. I tried to disguise my dread, standing on the stone floor to greet her, but as I started to bow, she cuffed my ear with the tip of her staff. Swallowing her pastry, she declared, You be unhappy to see me. Her sharp voice echoed among the walls of the chamber. I rubbed my tender ear, striving to remain polite. I am grateful to you for healing my leg. That be true. She shook her head, clinking her shell earrings. Yet still you be unhappy to see me. I glared at her. We didn't part on the happiest terms last time we met. She snorted angrily, and the two dwarves at the door reached for their axe handles. My shadow, sensing trouble, shrank down on the floor by my feet. But Urnalda raised her hand, saying, Not yet. I still be feeling gracious toward our guest. The renowned wizard Merlin? You mean you want something from me? I snapped. The guards, who had released their weapons, reached for them again. They turned their bearded faces to the enchantress, awaiting her command. Urnalda, though, seemed unperturbed. She nodded her adorned head, jostling her earrings. You be wiser, Merlin, at least a little. A crooked grin creased the pale skin of her face. But be you wise enough to win back your wizard staff and your precious sword? That be not so clear. My staff and sword? I thundered. You have them. Mayhaps, wizard, mayhaps. Yet before Urnalda decides whether to help you, it be up to you to help Urnalda. Behind her, one of the guards grunted in approval. The enchantress whirled around instantly, jabbing a stubby finger at him. I not be asking your opinion, she spat. His red eyes opened wide. Mm -hmm. My apologies, Urnalda. Good. She shook her finger at him menacingly. Be certain it does not happen again. Yes, Urnalda, he replied, standing rigidly at attention. As soon as she turned around again to face me, though, the guard glanced at his companion and gave him a sly wink. Immediately the enchantress spun around, her purple robe swishing on the stones. She took a step toward the dwarf, who backed up against the iron door. So now! You mock me, do you? N no, Urnalda, he replied. This time, judging from the beads of perspiration on his brow, he was truly afraid. My, 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 my beard, I, I wasn't. She hunched forward, her wild red hairs quivering with rage. Then by your beard, you be a liar. Before he could object, 
she raised her hand and snapped her fingers. A scarlet flash lit the underground chamber, obscuring everything, even the torches. As the red light faded, a change in the dwarf's appearance was clear. His tangled black beard had vanished. In its place sprouted a mass of bright pink feathers, delicately curling like the plumes of an exotic bird. The guard, still unaware of the change, stood motionless. His companion, however, started to guffaw, until Urinalda silenced him with a glare. Anxiously, the transformed dwarf reached up to stroke his beard. Feeling feathers instead of hair, he released a terrible howl. He plucked a long pink feather, took one look at it, and bolted out the door. He ran down the passageway, his wailing cries reverberating among the stone walls. With a sidelong look at the other guard, who was shivering to hold back his laughter, Urnalda turned her squat frame around to face me. Her cheeks, normally pale grey, were still flush with anger. As she studied me, her eyes narrowed. Be you wanting your precious sword and staff? I need them, yes, and now, for we have much work to do, you and I. The crooked grin returned to her face. We? Now it be you who want something. That's right, I declared. All Finkyra is in trouble. Finkyra? She sniffed, adjusting the jewelled band on her brow. And why be that any concern for the dwarves, the people of Urnalda? I started to speak when she raised her stout hand. I be uninterested in your tales of woe, Merlin. I only be interested in my people. But hush, she commanded. And be not so foolish as to try any of your enchantments on me. Her voice lowered a notch. You'll be faring poorly enough against your sword-armed adversary, and you'll be faring far worse against Urnalda. Besides, she added with a throaty chuckle, I still be holding my staff. I started. You know about Slayer? Hush! He could be part of the plot against... Hush, young wizard! She leaned forward, her earrings vibrating as she stared up at me. Here be my terms. Answer my question, and I return your possessions. Fail, and... Well, that be my decision. You must listen, I protested. She jammed the base of her staff onto the stone underfoot, sending up a spray of dust and pebbles. No, you be mistaken. I shall speak, and you shall listen. With effort, I held my tongue. Good, then. Here be my question. She drew in her breath to say whatever it was, then suddenly caught herself. Turning to the guard, she waved her hand at him. Stand outside the door, and be not eavesdropping, or I be changing your beard hairs into slithery worms. The dwarf anxiously touched his beard. He bustled out the doorway and into the tunnel, marching at least a dozen paces before coming to a halt. Apparently satisfied, the enchantress faced me once more. She cleared her throat then began speaking in a raspy whisper. My question be this. For several weeks now, my visions of the future be strangely clouded. That never be happening before, not to Urnalda, so brave, so wise. She paused, choosing her words. I be unable to see anything, anything at all, past the night we call Dundilgul's Eve, the longest night of the year. Her pale brow contorted. Except snakes, ghostly snakes, who be hissing and spitting at each other. They be coming often in my visions. 
Disdainfully, she spat on her hands and rubbed them together briskly. But Ornalda cares not about the snakes. Ornalda cares about seeing nothing else. She grimaced, trembling with rage. This be unacceptable, an enchantress without visions. I nodded grimly. And your question is why it's happened? She ground her staff into the stone floor. That be my question. And if I answer it, you will return my staff and sword? Those be my terms. The answer, I said flatly, has nothing to do with your powers. You are still as strong as ever. It has to do, instead, with the future. Unmistakably, a look of relief washed over her face. Then her expression darkened. She asked, her voice no longer a whisper, What be this future? I only know what I learned from a vision several nights ago. Dogda came to me, spoke to me. Urnalda's back straightened. The greatest of the spirits spoke to you? A wizard so young he is yet to grow a beard? Yes, about the future. She scrutinized me, and I could tell she was trying to judge the truth of what I'd said. After a few seconds, she gave a nod. Go on! He said that on winter's longest night, the other world of the spirits and the world of Finkyra will come perilously close. A passageway of some sort will open between them at the stone circle, the dance of the giants. I drew a ragged breath. And through that passageway, Rita Gower and all his forces will come pouring out, bent on crushing every mortal life in their path, unless you and I and the rest of Finkyra are there to stop them. For a long period, she gazed at one of the torches, hissing and sputtering in its clasp on the wall. Did he say anything more? Some things I didn't understand, yes, about lost wings and other notions. But the point of it all was a warning, not just to me or the race of men and women, but to all the people of this land. Hopefully, I reached out my hands to her. Won't you join me, Urnalda? Help save the world we share? Swinging her staff, she slapped away my hands. Join you and the race of men! Fight alongside the very same warriors who be trying not long ago to destroy my people. Her voice grew shrill. Have you no memory of what your ruler, Stangmar, whose blood be running through your own veins, did to the dwarves? It's our only hope, I pleaded. Your only hope. The people of Urnalda be surviving now very well indeed. Her face relaxed for a moment and took on a look of deep longing. One day our people will be truly free from harm, enough to stop building more tunnels and defences. Then we'll be constructing a great stone amphitheatre, open to the air and sky, the amphitheatre of Urnalda's people. I be wanting this for more years than you be living, Merlin, a place where I be able to view all my people at once, a place for my weekly addresses and dramatic plays in my honour. Suddenly she snapped out of her reverie. She stamped angrily on the floor, sending a rumble through the stones of the chamber. It seemed to shake the very bedrock, vibrating for several seconds before fading away. Go talk to the giants, those hairy-footed dunces, about fighting alongside you. They'd be dangerous and almost as terrible to the dwarves as men. But they'd be stupid, very stupid. So, mayhaps, you'd be more successful. Scowling, I struck the flat of my hand against the stone wall. It's you, Urnalda, who are stupid and stubborn as immovable as these very stones. Do you really think you can evade Rita Gower after he's taken the lands above? Why, your underground realm will be as easily broken as a butterfly's wing in his hand. The eyes of the Enchantress blazed as bright as the torches. 
I never be joining forces with the race of men. Never. Holding back my wrath, I decided to try one last time. Please, I know you care deeply about your people's well-being. I've heard many stories about how much you have done for them in your rule. For their sake, you must reconsider. You flatter me, wizard, she spat back. You be knowing nothing about my rule. My dwarves be forbidden to speak of such things to your race. No, I speak honestly. My friend Shim, a true giant who lived for a time among your people, has told me many stories. And he is a traitor and a spy. She squeezed her staff so hard that thin trails of smoke started rising from the runes on the shaft. Of all the giants, he be the worst, masquerading as one of Urnalda's people. If he ever sets foot again in my realm, he will be killed immediately. She grimaced at me. We be ready for him, oh yes, if he be so foolish to return. You're wrong about him, I fumed, and wrong about what's best for your people. Can't you understand? I'm trying to warn you about the gravest danger we have ever known. Urnalda merely glared at me. You be better off, Merlin, worrying about other dangers. Yes, like your sword-armed friend. Her eyes gleamed strangely. He be closer, much closer, than you know. Before I could ask what she meant, she clapped her stout palms together. The stones beneath my feet started to quiver, then shake violently. Dust rose out of the cracks. I jumped aside, just as the floor split open in a narrow chasm. To my astonishment, my staff and sword rose out of the depths, passing through the opening, floating upward to meet me. I reached for them instantly, not willing to give the enchantress any chance to change her mind. As I sheathed my sword, I growled at her. You may be stubborn, but at least you honor your word. Better than most of your race, she retorted. Honor. That will be the subject of my first address to all my people one day, when my great amphitheater be built. She furrowed her brow. Whenever that may be. Her stubby fingers drummed the wood of her staff. You be a fool, Merlin, but you too be honorable. You answered my question as I be hoping. Even if you be insulting me as well, that be my reason for healing your wounds, though you be nearly dead from bleeding. And so weak it took Urnalda many days to coax back your strength. I blanched. Many days. Bending nearer, I demanded, How much time is left before the longest night? Seven days, young wizard, come the next sunset. Then we be finding out the truth of your vision. Chapter 17 Seeds Several hours later, the band of dwarves escorting me through the maze of underground tunnels came to an abrupt halt. Their low, rhythmic chant, which they had kept up from the moment Urnalda sent us off, also stopped. My passionate cursings, though, continued. Why did I have to waste so much time marching? Why couldn't she have set me free through the closest doorway, as I'd pleaded? Even now, we faced not a door, but a dark slab of stone. The wavering torchlight revealed a complex pattern of runes swirling across its surface. Runes that held, I knew, the symbols of enchantment. Without a word, two of the stout, bearded fellows shoved me roughly toward the slab. My staff caught on a rim of rock across the floor, and I stumbled forward. Throwing my arm across my face, I braced myself to smash into the stone. But I didn't fall into it. Instead, I fell through it, landing on my face on hard-packed ground. Rolling over, I spit out some stems and frosted bits of leaves. The first sunlight I'd felt in days warmed the back of my neck 
though the air still felt wintry. With a mixture of anger and admiration, I gazed at the apparently solid boulder out of which I'd just tumbled. Urnalda's skills were, indeed, extraordinary. Virtually no one would perceive the doorway buried in that boulder, let alone find some way to open it. No one but Rita Gower. He would, no doubt, make quick work of all her secret entrances and clever defences, and he'd be just as merciless with her as she planned to be with Shim. What had she meant, exactly, when she vowed that she'd be ready for the giant if he ever returned? Some sort of trap awaited him, that much was certain. But what kind? An enormous pit? A slew of specially treated spears? I shook my head. If only Urinalda had paid more attention to my warning than to her rage against men and giants, then everyone, including her own people, would be better off. Casting a glance around, I spotted some low, flat hills sprinkled with a few twisted trees on the horizon. Snow streaked the hills, alternating with patches of dark brown, making them look like a row of striped cakes. At once, I knew my location. Urnalda had released me near the far reaches of the eastern plains, the extreme edge of her realm. That explained the long march. Whether she had done that so I could be nearer to the Circle of Stones and the battle to come, I didn't know. But I suspected she just wanted to get me as far away as possible before setting me free. The position of the sun confirmed my fears about the time. Late afternoon had already arrived. I'd lost the better part of a day just getting here. The snow-striped hills gleamed in the golden light. Yet I saw no beauty in that scene. Barely one week remained, and I'd accomplished nothing, nothing at all. I hadn't defeated Slayer, nor found any way to stop his attacks, and he could have killed more children during the time I'd been with the dwarves. I could only hope that Rhea was faring better in her task of gathering support for Finkyra's cause. Where, I wondered, was she now? As I scanned the distant hills, my thoughts turned to someone else. Halia. I yearned to see her again, to bound by her side again. Only a few months ago we'd roamed together on this very terrain, following the ancient trails of her people. As usual, we'd kept entirely to ourselves, but for a brief visit to my friends, the aging gardeners Telian and Garlatha. That was an idea. I'd go there now, to their cottage in the hills. They could give me no help in my quest, that I knew, but they could provide something else, something they had given me many times before, a brief respite from my troubles, a moment of quiet in the company of friends, and a chance to think about what to do next. I started trudging toward the hills, blowing frosty breaths, my shadow moving despondently at my side. It knew, as did I that my problems, and Finkyra's, worsened by the hour. With each step, my staff's tip stabbed the hardened ground, impaling dead leaves and crusted dirt. In time, the land started rising to meet the snowy hills. A falcon soared overhead, screeching in its high, whistling voice, but otherwise the world seemed empty of life. Hollows, where, in spring... Water splashed down over mossy stones and dew-soaked rushes, lay dry and hard. A young hawthorn that would, in a different season, explode with pink and white blossoms, stood as bare as my own staff. Just ahead I spied a spur of one of the hills, split by a deep cleft. My pace quickened, for I knew it well. Now, within the cleft, I could see the grey stone hut that seemed to sprout out of the very soil of the hillside, the home of my friends Telian and Garlatha. I approached the hut, dark in the shadow of the embracing hill. Then I glimpsed beside it a trace of green. The closer I came, the brighter the green appeared. Surprised, I concentrated my vision to make certain. But no, the colour was there lavishly there. Rows of trees, every bit as leafy as Rhea's gown, 
stood on both sides of the hut. The branches hung low, laden with ripening fruits. As I drew nearer, I could make out luscious golden pears and some purple plums as big as my fist, as well as cherries, apples, and my favorite, the spiral-shaped fruit of the larkum tree. Beneath the fragrant boughs ran hedges of berries, overflowing with blackberries, strawberries, and brambleberries. Even the rare lear berry, capable of healing torn muscles, and, it was said, broken dreams, grew in abundance. Trailing vines, including two or three heavy with grapes, clung to the walls of the house. A cluster of light blue flowers draped over the doorway. I chewed my lip, bewildered. It was one thing to see this garden still blooming in autumn, as I had with Harlia. But now, in the midst of winter, even the great gardening prowess of my friends couldn't turn back the cycle of the seasons. All of a sudden, I understood. Just as Rhea had been entrusted with one of the treasures of Vinkyra, so had this couple. They cared for the legendary flowering harp, whose magical strings could coax any land to life any plant to flower. How fitting, I thought, that so much life remained within their garden wall, for Telian and Garlatha themselves, despite their great age, seemed never to lose their vitality. This showed in their passion for gardening, as well as their passion for arguing ferociously, the kind of arguing only possible for people who have lived together many years. I recalled with fondness how Garlatha often teased her husband that she could see right through him, but still enjoy the view. Stepping through the wall's wooden gate, I felt a rush of warm air, as if I had stepped right into springtime. I undid the buttons of my vest, smelling the sweet fragrances. Dragonflies, honeybees, and green-backed beetles hovered round the blossoms, their wings humming. Up to the door I strode. Just as I started to knock on it, though, I heard a groaning sound from somewhere behind the hut. Swiftly I dashed round to the other side. When I rounded the corner, I halted, my shadow stretching behind me as if it were pulling away, trying to evade what confronted us. There lay Telian, his white hair falling loose about his shoulders, leaning against the trunk of an old cherry tree. His right hand clutched his chest, pinching the folds of his heavy brown tunic. But for the dark pupils of his eyes and the webbing of wrinkles that surrounded them, his face was completely pale. Kneeling by his side, Garlatha stroked his brow, her own face much the same. In unison, their heads swiveled toward me. Garlatha, her eyes brightening, exclaimed, Oh, it's you, Merlin. If ever we needed your healing powers, it's now. Weakly, the old man shook his head. Not even a wizard can help me now, my duck. I stepped forward, kneeling next to Garlatha. Tell me what happened. With her starkly veined hand, she pointed at the russet sack made of homespun cloth that lay open among the cherry tree's roots. Tyrion was out here, gathering seeds from the fallen fruit, as we always do, to plant them come spring, when he suddenly collapsed. She ran her hand through her husband's white mane. It was all I could do to get him over here, where he could sit up. My chest, said Telian with a groan, hurting badly, squeezing me, can hardly, oh, good doctor, hardly breathe. I lay my hand below his, flat against the ribs. Focusing my mind, I tried to sense each of his organs in turn. Liver, then stomach, left lung, then right, intestines, and heart. A twisting bolt of pain shot through my hand and up my arm, making me jerk backward. Wincing, I gazed at him. It's your heart, 
I said, my voice shaking. Telian, it feels, well, very deep. I don't know if it's something I can heal. He swallowed, working his tongue. It's not. I, I can feel it. Don't be so sure now, reproached Galatha. When you're most sure, you're most wrong. Her mate smiled weakly. Have you only just learned that, my duck, after sixty-nine years of marriage? Seventy, his spouse corrected. Whatever it's been, I declared, I'm not giving up on you yet. Let me try to find a way. Replacing my hand on his ribs, I started to probe more deeply. You never did give up easily, Telian said crustily. I remember when you first came through here on the way to take on Stangmar and all his soldiers at once, while you hardly stayed long enough to taste a lark on fruit. Sensing the layers of torn tissues within his heart, I felt a wave of nausea. Still, I did my best to keep my composure, to sound relaxed and confident. I remember that fruit, like a bite of sunshine it was, purple sunshine, best fruit I've ever tasted. Or ever will, said Garlatha flatly. That fruit holds so much more inside its skin than you'd ever guess. Like those seeds over there, I observed, still trying to work my way down through the tissues. The same is true for them. Yes. She agreed. Oh, like children, I'm always amazed by all they hold inside. Even as I probed deeper in the old man's heart, her words made me shudder. Telian groaned loud and long. At the same time, another wave of nausea washed through me, this time so powerfully that I needed to lean back against the knotted trunk of the tree to steady myself. Trembling, I lifted my hand from his chest. It's just too deep. Glancing down at my shadow, I saw it nodding its head somberly. Something is broken or ripped in there, but I just don't know how to heal it. The old man's eyes flicked toward the hut. Same uh, as the harp, he muttered. The flowering harp? I turned to Garlatha, who was clutching her husband's hand. Is it broken? It is, she whispered, never taking her eyes off her mate. This morning, without any warning, it fell off its peg, where it's rested safely for so long. Such a clatter and clang it made. When we went to fetch it, all the strings but one had snapped. And when Tyrion reached down to lift the instrument, that last string broke. It curled itself up to the sound box, making a cry like a tortured, wailing babe. A tear slid slowly over the folds of Garlatha's wrinkled cheek. At first I thought she was thinking of the harp, and perhaps of her garden, that would no longer feel its magic. Then, seeing her quivering hand stroking Telian's, I knew better. It's not so much, he said to her, that I don't want to die. His face contorted as another spasm of pain coursed through him. I just don't want to leave you alone. The dark eyes shone as he added, who will be left to quarrel with you? She nodded solemnly. Our life together is like a precious bulb holding whatever we need to last the seasons. No, no, not really, he countered. More like a wind-blown seed that can land anywhere and survive. 
I thought of Halia, now so far away, who wore around her wrist the string of another broken instrument. It seems to me, I offered, that your life together is more like something else. Surprised, Galatha glanced over at me. What's that? A pair of trees grown so closely together that their branches have intertwined. They are still independent trees, you see, standing on their own roots. But now they are more than that as well. A new being altogether, for they support each other, shelter each other, and hold each other every day. For a long interval, both of the elders stared at me. Finally, Garlotha broke the silence. With a breaking voice, she asked, But how does one tree go on living without the other? I shook my head, looking up into the boughs of the cherry tree, speckled with dark red fruit. Do you remember, asked Telian, on that day you first came here, you told us a tale from another land about two people who had lived a long life together. When it came time for one of them to die, the gods turned them both into trees, exclaimed Galatha. Can you, Merlin? Can you do that for us? Please, asked her husband, wriggling higher against the trunk. That is my desire also. I raised my hand. Wait now. I'm not sure I can do such a thing, and even if I could, I'm not sure you really want that. Oh, but we do, implored the old woman, more than you can imagine. She looked into Telian's eyes. Much more. It would be risky, I protested, my tone grave. Transformations like that involve your spirits as well as your bodies. It could end up damaging both, maybe severely. Please, they begged in unison. No, no, I really shouldn't. Please, Merlin. I gazed at them for some time, feeling the strength of their desire. At last, I nodded. They deserved the chance to choose their own risks and their own fates. Slowly, I stood up. Taking hold of my staff, I moved back a few paces, careful not to trip over a hedge bulging with blackberries. Drawing a deep breath, I concentrated all my strength. At the same time, with hopeful looks, Telian and Galatha gripped each other's hands more tightly than ever. After a moment... I began reciting to myself the various chants that could, I knew, release the magic that filled every seed, that powered every spring, the magic of changing. A new warmth flowed through my body, from my innermost chest right down to my fingertips. The wind stirred, rustling the tree's branches and causing a few cherries to fall to the ground. Leaves and twigs and scattered seeds lifted into the air circling around me in the white-haired couple, shining with a light that came not from the lowering sun. A flash of white light exploded. I stumbled backward from the force of it, falling in a heap. When I looked again at the spot where my friends had been, I saw that they had disappeared, vanished entirely. In puzzlement, I looked around me. Nothing else had changed. The trees stood as before, as did the greystone hut. Even the sack of seeds lay on the ground, undisturbed. My mind reeled. What had I done? Something had gone wrong, terribly wrong. I had meant to transform them, not... Groping for some sort of answer, I crawled to the base of the cherry tree, studying the ground where my friends had been only seconds before. There was no sign of them, no hint of an explanation, except for the one possibility, too terrible to grasp. I had eliminated them. Body, spirit, everything. Overcome with grief, I clambered to my feet. Dazedly, I picked up the russet bag of seeds along with my staff and began to shuffle to the front of the hut. I couldn't speak, 
nor think, nor feel. I was numb. The garden that had, not long ago, seemed so full of life, now felt utterly empty. As I came around to the other side, I moved somberly along the wall toward the swinging gate. When I reached it, I started to go through, when something made me turn around for a last look at the hut. As soon as I did, I dropped the seed bag in astonishment, for there, before the entrance, stood a pair of majestic larkon trees, their boughs dappled with fruit, their leafy branches wrapped around each other securely, and I knew, as I studied them, that they would stand together for a wondrously long time. My gaze fell to the open sack of seeds. Many of them had spilled onto the garden's rich soil. Some were as tiny as specks of dirt, others much larger than the special one in my satchel. They glinted at me, aflame in the last golden light of the day. Seeds, Garlatha had said, were like children, holding all the hopes and possibilities of the future. All at once an idea struck me. I knew in that instant how to stop the sword-armed warrior from doing more harm. I had barely enough time, but still it might be done. With a final glance at the spreading pair of trees, I strode out of the garden. Chapter 18 Gathering As the garden gate swung closed behind me, I entered winter again. A frigid gust of wind swept off the bare hillside above the hut, slapping my face and chilling me instantly. I felt as if I'd plunged into a mountain tarn, its water as cold as the surrounding snowfields. My hands stiffened, as did my toes, and no more luscious aromas tickled my nostrils. Instead, all I could smell was cold dirt, cold grass, and cold air. Breathing frosty breaths, I buttoned my mother's vest with my numbing fingers. On the ground, my shadow looked as thin as a frozen sapling. Its long body seemed to shiver as I stepped away from the gate. High above, the scudding clouds shone deep red and purple, as did the wings of a lone sparrow swooping past. The swollen sun dropped lower in the sky, almost ready to disappear behind the wide stretch of plains. Seven days come the next sunset. Those words of Urnalda rang in my ears, hastening my heartbeat as before. Now, though, I had a plan. Rather than trying to defeat the sword-armed warrior, which seemed impossible, or waste valuable time searching for him again, I would change my tactics. Instead of battling Slayer, I would throw all my zeal into keeping him from doing any more harm. I glanced over my shoulder at the verdant garden of my friends, and the sack of seeds on the ground. Just as they had gathered all those seeds, so would I gather all the unprotected children. Yes, I'd find as many as I could and remove them from danger, whether they were orphaned or otherwise separated from their families. That way, at least Finkyra's most vulnerable children could escape Slayer's attacks. There couldn't be more than a few dozen of them on this island, a manageable number to gather, and if I could somehow do it within a week, I'd still be able to join Rhea before the longest night. But how? I started pacing back and forth on the hillside, my mind churning. On the frozen ground, my shadow paced as well, its form growing longer as the sun drew closer to the horizon. To be sure, I'd need some help. There simply wasn't enough time left for one person to assemble all the unprotected children of the land— now, more than ever, I wished that I'd mastered the power of leaping. Stamping hard as I paced to keep myself warm, my mind turned to another problem. Where to take the children after I'd gathered them? It should be some place far removed, where they would remain out of danger. Some place where even Slayer, with all his power, couldn't find them. I ground my teeth, even as they chattered. My plan was really no plan at all. Unless I could find some place to hide them, 
the children would be just as endangered as before. Pacing up the slope, I watched the scudding clouds overhead. Bathed in such deep colours, they looked almost solid, like islands of soil and stone. They seemed so unreachable floating on high, so entirely separate from the rest of the world. I halted, leaning against my staff. Unreachable, separate, removed. Those were the qualities of islands, and of one island in particular. The Forgotten Island. I exhaled, blowing a white puff of air on my staff, frosting the image of a butterfly that had been etched into the wood. To get there, I knew, I'd have to break through the thick web of spells that separated the island from the rest of Finkyra. That would not be easy. Yet that very obstacle, if I could somehow surmount it, would give true protection to the children. Still, I wondered what we'd find once we arrived there. I really knew almost nothing about the place. Once, long ago, a wise spirit named Guri of the Golden Hair had said a wreath of golden mistletoe, the emblem of the other world, grew on the island. She had, alas, revealed nothing more. But if mistletoe, the golden bough, bloomed there, the land must at least be habitable. I shook my head. These were problems for later. Besides, I still hadn't solved my original problem, how to find the children, and somehow gather them in the days that remained. Unless I found help, and soon, nothing else would matter. Deep in thought, I stared at the ground, following the line of my shadow. With the sun nearly on the horizon, the dark form now stretched most of the way up the hillside, looking much like a slender giant. In a flash, I knew both the person who could help and the best way to reach him. Shadow, I called, I need you. On the crimson-coloured hill, my shadow's head tilted sceptically. Hear me now, I beseeched, using my most dramatic tones. Your homeland and mine are in grave danger, as you know well. So are those innocent young ones who have no one but themselves to rely upon. I have a plan to protect them, but it can only work with your help. As I'd hoped, the shadow's head lifted, and its chest seemed to swell with pride. You must go find Shim. Now, stop shaking your head. He's up north with the giants of Varigal, and it's up to you to locate him. Stop that shaking, I say. I need you to convince him to seek out all the orphan children he can find, as well as any other children wandering around unguarded. He must bring them to me at the shore of the Speaking Shells, by the dunes where the great river enters the sea. You know the spot. Since I'll need the better part of three days to walk there, let's meet three days from now. Though its head shaking ceased, the shadow placed its hands on its hips obstinately. I could feel, even in the bitter wind, the icy stare it was sending me. Please now, your help could make all the difference. The obstinate pose didn't change. Please, I implored. The shadow stepped a few paces away, then turned back to face me. What? I exclaimed. You want what? No, no, I can't do that. Out of the question. Sternly, the shadow folded its arms. Outrageous, I declared. Completely outrageous. The shadow simply glared at me, as I glared back. The sun sank lower, dimming the light as well as my shadow. I knew that only a few more minutes remained when I could see the dark form and talk with it. Following sunset, I would have to wait until dawn to continue. After all, I didn't even know where it spent its nights. Some mornings I half expected to find it hadn't returned, though that had never happened, yet. Oh! All right, then, I growled. Your condition is unjust, undignified, and unacceptable, I glared at the insolent shadow. But I agree to it anyway. Find Shin and help him collect the children, including Plu, back at that village. 
If you do that, I will... The words seemed to vanish like the white vapours of my breath. I glanced over my shoulder at the setting sun, then turned back to the shadow. I will grant you a full week off every year to go wherever you choose and do whatever mischief you like. Gloatingly, the long head nodded. Then my shadow strode down from the hillside and passed me on the frozen turf. Breaking into a loping run, it headed northwest with surprising speed, fading swiftly with the sun. Chapter 19 The Mind of the Mist As I trekked to the southern shore for my meeting with Shim, I passed many leafless trees creaking in the wind and several frozen ponds, but precious few living creatures moving about. Once I watched a fox, bushy-tail erect, padding across a snowy field. Once I spotted a pair of tiny light flyers darting behind a boulder. But that was all. Near the ford of the river unceasing, I found some strange tracks, deep ruts gouged like claw marks in the soil heading toward the east. I had no idea what they could be, nor time to find out. Under the swelling moon, I kept walking late into the night. All the while, I pondered my plan. Could Shim gather the children in time? And assuming he succeeded, how would we get to the forgotten island? We could probably build some sort of vessel to cross the water, though that wouldn't be easy. Then, of course, we'd still have to pass through the barrier of spells. Yet I preferred all these uncertainties to the thought of Slayer's attacks continuing, and to the thought of battling him again myself. On the second day of my trek, I veered south, following the river unceasing. Even in winter, its waters pounded and sprayed. Sometimes I glimpsed vague movements within the spray, and wondered if I'd seen river sprites on the move, but I couldn't be certain. As I moved southward, the cold grew less bitter and snow vanished from the banks, yet winter's grip never loosened on the land. Even as I passed through the floodplains where the river widened into marshes that teemed with animals and birds in other seasons, I saw nothing but a snake sliding over a web of dried vines on the ground. Just before I reached the coast, I caught sight of Druma Wood to the west. Viewing its vibrant greens again, I felt a yearning, as sweet as hemlock, to live among those trees with my dearest friends again. Yet that, I felt certain somehow, was impossible. In the pale light of early afternoon, I approached the row of dunes lining the southern shore. I'd reached my destination, almost a day ahead of Shim, if, that is, he was coming. I could only wait and wonder how all this would end. I started climbing the highest of the dunes, my boots and staff sinking into the sand. Like the shell of a great turtle, the dune rose steeply at first, then more gradually toward the top. Marching higher, I heard the surf crashing against the other side. The barest whiff of salt enlivened the air. I disturbed a black cormorant who flapped angrily and flew, neck outstretched, to a neighboring mound. At last I reached the top. Breathing hard, I sat down to empty my boots of sand. Beside me rested a large, tightly curled shell, its purple point jutting upward like a spiraling spear. Turning toward the water, I saw nothing but a rolling wall of mist, so dense that it obscured the waves beyond. This was the mist that encircled all the lands of Finkaira, the mist that made the storied threads that were woven, Holly's people believed, into the carpet Kaer Lachlan, the mist that moved according to its own mysterious mind. Hidden though they were, the waves announced themselves. For a long moment I listened to them heave and slosh, slap and pound. With its own unending rhythm, the sea itself was breathing, drawing watery breaths as it had for ages upon ages. Somewhere out there, I knew, 
swam the glistening bodies of the legendary people of the Mer. So elusive were they that in all my travels I had only seen them twice, and even then for just an instant. Yet their voices had long called to me, silently, fascinating me. Mer people. They seemed somehow near, even now, when the mist obscured their watery realm. Perhaps there was some truth to the tale that my own grandmother, Owen, wife of the powerful wizard Tuatha, had emerged from the sea, forever binding her people to the race of men and women. What, I brooded, would Tuatha do? Surely he could have found some way to transport the children to the island. Absently, I tapped the wood of my staff, which had long ago been touched by his power. A gentle scent of hemlock wafted to me, mixing with the briny breeze. Slowly, the wall of mist before me shifted, forming strange shapes within its depths. None of them could I recognize, yet all of them felt disturbing, as if they had been stolen from my most hideous dreams. Then, for a flicker, I glimpsed an eye, dark and mysterious, Watching me, I felt sure of it. To Arthur, I stared at the eye, even as it melted away. No, it couldn't be him. Dogda, perhaps? Or perhaps Rita Gower? The heavy, arched brow was the last part of the eye to fade. As I watched, it coalesced, transforming into a fluid, shimmering wing— it stretched across the shore, fluttering as if buffeted by the winds of flight. Then it, too, dissolved, disappearing into the shifting clouds. Beneath the wall of mist, I noticed something strange lying upon the sand. It appeared to be a kind of rope, running the full length of the beach, but a rope made from kelp, eelgrass, gull feathers, and other gifts from the sea— rolled together by the gently lapping waves, and pushed higher and higher on the sand as the tide lifted. It had been left behind when the high water finally receded. Sadly, I smiled. It was, truly, a lover's braid, woven by the ocean itself and given to the land. It made me think of the woman whose auburn hair I loved to braid, and whose own gifts came from some place as deep as the sea. Something tugged on my tunic, near my waist. To my amusement, a small crab, mottled brown, was scaling me like a mountain. Carefully, I lifted him by the back, but his largest claw pinched the cloth tightly. I tugged, and he finally let go, though his wriggling made me drop him. He fell onto the hilt of my sword with a ping. The sound swelled for an instant ringing like a distant chime, then faded into the sound of the surf. I thought of Slayer and his own deadly blades. What was it about him that had seemed so oddly familiar? It might have been his stance or his voice, yet that didn't seem possible. Someone of his power and wickedness I'd surely remember. As I pondered, the mist seemed to harden flattening as if it were a sheet of metal. Like an enormous sword, it rose right off the base of the dunes, slicing a crisp line between sand and surf. I wondered how Slayer had come by his power. It rattled me that his abilities so closely mirrored my own. I gave weight to his sword, he did the same to mine. I transformed myself into a deer or called upon the wind, he followed suit. It was terribly hard to fight someone like that. Impossible, really. As if I were dueling against myself. Dueling against myself. A new idea struck me, one that sent a jolt down my spine. Was it possible, even remotely, that my adversary had no real power of his own? That his magic came not from himself, but from me? Listening to the waves surging behind the sheer wall of mist, I considered this radical notion. It might just be possible that, 
in unleashing my skills in battle, I was somehow empowering my own enemy. My gaze moved down to the base of the dune, where a glistening pool of seawater, as slender as a snake, wound its way through the rounded stones and brightly coloured shells. Pink, yellow, and lavender the shells glowed. Like the spiralling one beside me, all of them had once made their home somewhere beyond the mist, beneath the waves. All of them had been brutally torn away from that home, removed from the world they knew, and finally hurled ashore, just as I had been on this very spot. It seemed so long ago that day I washed ashore. Brackish water soured my mouth. I had no parentage that I knew, no identity that I believed. Yet, despite all that, I remember having felt a tender spark of hope, a belief that somehow I would find what I yearned for, if only I searched long and hard enough. I sighed, wishing I felt that same spark today. Instead, I felt a growing sense of doom and a deep ache, worse than usual, in the tender spot between my shoulder blades. On an impulse, I grasped the pointed top of the purple shell beside me. Pulling hard, I extracted it from the dune, spraying my tunic with sand in the process. With care, I lifted it higher and pressed its open end to my ear. A rushing, coursing sound came pouring forth, and with it, something more. Fly, spoke the shell in its breathy voice. Fly far. I nearly dropped it on the sand. Fly? But how? Cautiously, I replaced it on my ear. Fly, repeated the shell, its voice rushing to me as a wave rolls to shore. Unsettled, I lowered it. Maybe I'd only imagined its voice, twisted into words, the sound of the sea. But no, I knew better. This was a place, as I'd learned before, where the shells might speak, whether or not the listener could understand. I gently replaced the shell in its sandy lair, puzzling over its choice of words. The mist softened and began to shift yet again. The metallic sheen vanished, replaced by rolling billows. Then the vaporous wall withdrew, revealing much more of the beach. Before me lay a wide stretch of fine golden sand, dotted with shafts of driftwood, starfish, crab parts, sea kelp, and colourful shells, including whelks, conks, mussels, and ribbed scallops. Wet from spray, the shells gleamed like precious metals, gold, iron, silver, and bronze. Past the beach lapped the shallow waters of the surf, the thin leading edge of the ocean beyond. At that moment, a lone seabird broke through the mist, it was a brown cormorant, its long neck curved like an enormous worm. Landing in the shallows with a splash, it padded around, squawking noisily. A few seconds later, another bird soared out of the vapours. This one, a blue-tinged heron, splashed down, ambled onto the beach, and stood regally, looking out to sea. Another cormorant joined them, then a pair of brightly painted ducks, followed by a ragged-looking crane with black feathers all askew. Still more birds arrived, swimming and preening and wading together. As more and more birds descended from the sky, crowding the beach, their sound overwhelmed even the ceaseless sloshing of the waves. They chattered and piped continuously, flapping their wings great and small, stamping through the shallows and tide pools, smacking their beaks with gusto. Whenever several flew together, I could feel the rush of air from their wings, their own gentle wind. Fascinated, I watched them, for I'd never seen the massing of such a huge number of birds. A rush of wind blew across my cheeks. Expecting to see a new group of flyers, I looked up, but there were no birds there, only air. 
The wind blew again, warmer than before, almost like a living breath. With it came a particular smell, the faintest scent of cinnamon. It was a scent I well remembered. Ayla! I called to the wind sister, who had once carried both Rhea and me across the whole length of Finkyra. Ayla, it's you! Ah, yes, Henry Smerlin. I have come. Her whispering voice swept around me like a whirlwind, fluttering the sleeves of my tunic. And with you I shall stay for a while, though the wind never stays very long. Suddenly an idea struck me. Ayla, sometime tomorrow some children will arrive here, and I must take them away so they'll be safe. I paused as a large wave splashed onto the beach, raising a great cacophony from the birds. Could you help me, Ella? Could you carry them across the water to the forgotten island? The warm air flowed over my face, surrounding me with the aroma of cinnamon. I cannot stay until tomorrow, Henry Smerlin, for very soon I must go to other seas and other shores. But I need your help. I cannot stay, Emery Smerlin. I cannot. She spun around me, whirling in the air. And you will need more help than mine if you wish to voyage to that island. Many others have tried. Ah, yes, but none have ever succeeded. I struck the sand with my fist. I must succeed. Then you must try, Henry Smerlin. You must try. Pleadingly, I asked again, Can't you help us? For several seconds, the cloak of warm air encircled me. I cannot help in the way you ask for tomorrow. I shall be far, far from here. My sisters and I are gathering as the wish Lahelagons have done for years beyond count, at the place we call the wellspring of the wind. Yet I shall return, Henry Smerlin, on another day, and perhaps I can help you then. I need your help right now, I beseeched. You have other friends, ah, yes, who might be able to help. And now farewell, Henry Smerlin, farewell. With that, she brushed my cheek lightly. At the same time, the smell of cinnamon faded, and the warmth around me disappeared. Ayla had gone, and with her my fleeting moment of hope. Suddenly I winced. I'd forgotten to tell her about the longest night. Even if she couldn't help me save the children, she and her sisters might have helped at the battle. Damn, what an idiot I was to miss such a chance! I hunched forward on the dune, staring at the congregating water birds. After some time my thoughts returned to the children. What had Ayla meant when she'd spoken of other friends? My friends were scattered all across Finkyra, with plenty of difficulties of their own. They couldn't possibly help me right now. Still, would she have said that unless she knew something? At that instant, a shadow fell over me from behind. The shadow of a man. I spun around. Care pray! I leapt to my feet to embrace my old mentor, he threw back the hood of his heavy cloak and returned the hug. After a moment, he stepped back to study me in his inscrutable way. You look as worn out as I feel, Merlin. His mouth twisted wryly. Recall the lines from my last ode. So ready for rest. Alas, now the test. Yes, the test, I replied grimly. You always have the fitting couplet. 
Only because I've written so many, my boy. He looked at me wistfully. And yet the poetry never gets any easier to write, especially endings. They can be impossibly difficult. My greatest challenge. He paused. Except for your mother, that is. He fingered my astral vest. She's worth it, though, wouldn't you say? I managed to grin. How did you ever find me here? Shim, he's stomping around the countryside at a rapid pace, even for a giant, bearing a great load of passengers. So he got my message. I said, feeling relieved that at least one part of my plan was working. Yes, Capre replied, his eyes alight. And he is carrying them in a rather, well, unusual way. Tell me. No, no, I'll let it come as a surprise. He placed his arm around my shoulder. I do have something else to tell you, though. Something important. Come, sit with me, away from that throng of birds where it's quieter. You'll want to listen carefully. Chapter 20 Finn's Ballad Together, Capre and I strode down the sand to the lee of the dune, facing away from the sea. As we dropped lower, the noise from the water birds shrieking and honking lessened, though we continued to hear their clamour along with the sloshing waves. We sat in a small gully at the base of the dune, near a stand of trees drowned by one of the river unceasing's spring floods. Their whitened trunks, stripped of most of their bark, stood like gigantic arrows shot into the ground. Beyond the dead trees stretched the flood plains, a quilt of dry grass and hardened mud. Capre, I announced, I have a plan to save the children, a place where they'll be safe. Good, my boy. May whimsical fate not destroy, but create. I just have to figure out. Later, Merlin, you must hear what I've found. The gravity of his tone caught my attention. All right, then. What is it? He leaned closer. It's an ancient ballad, so obscure I'd forgotten about it completely. Until you spoke about your vision, that is. Urgently, he took my hand. It's written by the bard Finn Galeon. I shook my head. Who? He frowned, scratching the tip of his nose, a look I'd seen occasionally during our tutorial sessions over the years and which I knew meant something akin to, You blockhead! More slowly this time, he said, Finn Galeon, seer of the western shores. Blankly, I stared at him. Capre ground his teeth impatiently. He was a prophet, a seer, famous, at least to some of us. He wandered the coast centuries ago, putting his prophecies to verse. Unfortunately, most of his predictions are about as clear as the misty shores where he wrote them. But every so often, he gives quite a vivid glimpse of the future. Under his breath, he added, Though it may be a glimpse we'd rather not have. What does this ballad say? He closed his eyes, concentrating on the words, as his fingers drummed against his thigh. At length, he recited, On solstice that summons the year's longest night, Fincaira shall suffer the other world's might. For spirit and mortal, true-sighted and blind, there cometh a battle of ultimate kind. At dance of the giants, a gate doth appear on worlds out of balance, now riven by fear. When dawn's light caresses the circle of stones, the fate of Finkaira shall truly be known. If land long forgotten returns to its shore, 
and ancient opponents stand allies once more, then all through the heavens grand music may sound, the balance restored, the hidden wings found. Yet tidings more likely are vilely reversed, all hope torn asunder, the treasures all cursed. Then over the heavens a shroud shall descend, the longest of evenings, the uttermost end. His eyes reopened, watching me with concern. The stakes could not be higher, my boy. I nodded. You heard him mention wings, just as Doctor did. I just don't understand how that fits in. The poet rubbed his hands together, trying to warm them. Nor do I. The part that puzzles me most, though, is that earlier reference, if land long forgotten returns to its shore. Turning, he gazed at the bone-white trees. To himself, he muttered, It couldn't possibly mean the forgotten island. I drew a sharp breath. That's where I'm taking the children! His face showed, in rapid succession, surprise, doubt, and horror. You can't do that, Merlin. Don't you remember, ages ago, that place was part of Finkyra? Then Dogda cut it off completely, pushing it out to sea and surrounding it with spells. I know all that, and if I can just figure out how to get there... The children will be safe, out of that wicked warrior's reach forever. Vigorously, he shook his grey mane. Impossible! First of all, how do you plan to get there? Well, I... We could... Um... I see, he said gravely. Suddenly, an idea burst into my mind. I leapt up dashed over to the stand of dead trees and slapped my open hand against one of the whitened trunks. We'll build a raft. Yes, a, a great raft, using these trees. Shim will help me. It will work. I know it. My old mentor, far from sharing my enthusiasm, watched me with heightened concern. The ocean is the least of it, my boy. The spells. Don't forget the spells. No one. Not even your grandfather, Tuatha, has ever made it past them. And most of those who tried never returned. Angrily, I swung my arm. It collided with a small branch, snapping it in two and spraying me with shards. I must find a way. For the children, I must. The ridges on his brow seemed as deeply engraved as those on the sand dune behind him. Can't you battle this warrior? Battle him, yes, but I can't defeat him. I stepped closer, my face grim. He takes my own powers, somehow, and hurls them right back at me. That's right, so the children's best hope is to get as far away as possible. They, and you, may well die trying. Their chances are worse if I don't try. Folding my legs, I sat beside him again on the sand. Capre, you could help me. Tell me what you know about those spells. He bit his lip. Virtually nothing. Just that something terrible rises up out of the sea whenever someone gets too close to the island. Don't you see, my boy? Whatever dogged his reasons, he wanted no one to go back to that place. Ever. I blew a long breath. What could have happened there? Do you really think it had to do with the lost wings? That's my guess, he said with a shrug. Though no one knows. Why, everything about the island is a mystery. We don't even know if it ever had a name of its own. So it truly is forgotten, even its name. That's right, he said somberly. It's as if the whole place, even the memory of it, was destroyed. And if Finn's ballad is right, the same fate 
awaits Finkyra. Wait now, I protested. As bad as the ballad sounds, it still leaves room for hope. We might yet avoid that uttermost end. The dark pupils of his eyes seemed to grow distant. There is more, I'm afraid. You haven't heard the final stanza. His voice wavering, he recited the ballad's concluding lines. Beware, you that joineth, to rescue the cause. Your sacrifice, dearest, holds ruinous flaws. For times may occur so laden with cost, when all truly gained is yet truly lost. Those words again! Grasping a handful of sand, I poured it onto the side of my boot, watching the grains tumble over the edge and onto the ground. How can what is gained also be lost? Careprey drew his bushy brows together. Hard to know. It's only after sacrifice dearest, I fear, that we'll finally understand. For quite some time we sat in silence, hearing only our thoughts and the ongoing cries of the water birds on the other side of the dune. The ballad, once spoken, seemed etched upon my mind. Over and over I repeated some lines, though with no better understanding. At last the poet spoke again. Let's have a fire, Merlin, and a spot of food. He nudged his leather satchel. I've brought the makings. Yes, I replied. We need our strength if we're going to prevail. He paused in opening the satchel to smile at me fondly. My boy, you are persistence personified. No, no, I'm just hunger personified. With a flourish, he pulled out the contents of his satchel. Plenty of oatmeal for porridge, some dried bilberries, a large slab of honeycomb, a flask filled with apple cider, one vial of ground nutmeg, a cooking pot, and a pair of wooden spoons. Quickly, we set about collecting driftwood and dry grass to build a fire, the first I'd seen since the torches of the dwarves' underground realm. Soon crackling flames arose, warming our chilled hands. For a moment, I thought of Lou, coaxing our own fire to life back in the village. Did you return to the village after you went home? I asked, as Capre stirred the nutmeg into the simmering pot. And was Elaine there? And Lou? Yes, on all accounts, he replied. Little Lou brought her your message. She's staying there, as you demanded, though she's not very pleased about it. He gave the pot a final stir. There now, break off a generous piece of honeycomb and grab your spoon. In short order, we were eating porridge from the pot. Simple though it was, it seemed like a grand repast. The aromas of apple, oats and honey filled our nostrils, as well as the air beneath the dune. The porridge warmed our bodies thoroughly. The poet studied me as he blew on his spoon. In a way, it's really a blessing that Stangmar has reappeared. I nearly dropped my spoon. How so? Because otherwise your mother couldn't resist going to the circle of stones, not to fight, but to be near you and Rhea. Much as she detests being confined to that squalid little settlement, she's probably quite safe there, and she'll be spared all the horror of the battle. He gazed wistfully into the fire. Oh, gentle soul, thy innocence stole. I threw another piece of driftwood onto the flames. It's Stangmar's legacy, though, that's made it so difficult to win the allies we need— I tried with Urnalda, and she practically spat blood at me. The fire, as if in emphasis, crackled loudly. I doubt Rhea's having any better luck with the canyon eagles and the others. Sombre again, Capre said, If you don't return in time from this misadventure at the island, she may be there all alone. I'll be there. Whatever happens, I'll be there. 
quizzically, I examined him. You won't be there yourself. Me? He shook his grey head. I am a man of words, not weapons. As bad as I am fighting with the ending lines of a ballad, I'd be far worse fighting any living foe. No, the last thing you need is an old bungler like me on the battlefield. He gazed at me intensely across the flames. I shall be with you and Rhea in every other way, though. Yes, and so will that woman with the sapphire eyes. I know, I whispered. You'll be staying with Elaine, then, keeping her company through all this? His gaze never wavered. You can count on that, Merlin. As long as she'll have me, I'll stay by her side. I know no treasure even half so precious as a single day with her. Thoughtfully, I pursed my lips. In the ballad, where it spoke of the treasures of Finkyra, what did that mean? Nothing good, he answered. Finn was implying that the treasures are somehow linked to the future of Finkyra, so if the treasures are cursed, Rita Gower is likely to prevail. He ran his fingers through the sand of the dune. That seems unlikely, though, and besides, only the Caller of Dreams has been destroyed. What? I grabbed his tunic sleeve, imagining the graceful horn in his keeping. Often called the Horn of Good Tidings, it held the power to bring a person's most cherished dream to life. It's been destroyed! That's right. It cracked somehow, inexplicably, a few days ago. I was combing through my books, looking for the ballad. Suddenly, from its place on a neighboring shelf, it gave out a mournful wail and split in two. He frowned. There's no way to repair it. That's what happened, I exclaimed, to the flowering harp, destroyed with no explanation. He looked at me, aghast. Truly? Yes, and Rhea's orb is gone too, though in that case the curse came in the form of Stangmar. His body went rigid. He seemed lost in thought for a moment, then exclaimed, no. No, it can't be related. Why should the fate of the treasures be connected to the fate of Finkyra? I reached over and touched his knee. Because, my friend, it's not their fates that are connected, but their lives. They were hewn from the same wondrous fibers, by the same great forces. It's the magic of this land that gave birth to the treasures to begin with. It's the magic of this land that has empowered them always. Slowly, Capre nodded, his brow aglow from the firelight. You're right, Merlin. I see it now. With his boot, he pushed an ember back into the flames. And while I am gladdened that my student has become my teacher, I only wish it hadn't happened when we're about to lose everything. We haven't lost it yet, I declared. Listen now, do you recall that night, that terrible night, when you and I first met? He watched me, saying nothing. Well, on that night, you said something I've never forgotten. Seeing the grim line of his mouth relax ever so slightly, I continued. You told me that you couldn't say whether I really belonged in Finkyra, whether it was truly my home. The only one who could ever know that, you said, was me. Well, I'm telling you now that it is my home. It will always be my home, no matter what fate might befall it. Or me. I squeezed his knee, my sightless eyes watering. I love this land, Capre. So much, I'll give everything I have to save it. The poet swallowed hard then spoke. Then, my boy, it is truly your home. Chapter 21 Airborne Bodies
Late that afternoon, Carepray departed our sheltered niche at the base of the dune. He stood stiffly, knees cracking, and brushed some of the sand off his tunic. With an air of grim resolve, he studied me, the light from the lowering sun turning his hair silvery bronze. Good luck to you, my boy. You have revived my spirits, a major feat in its own right. True evidence of the strength of your powers. His fingers wrapped tightly round my arm, and his voice dropped to a whisper. Perhaps you will be the one to find the way to the island. That I will, I declared, jamming my staff into the sand, and then I'll do my best to turn back Rita Gower. His steady gaze faltered. No power, I fear, is strong enough for that. He'll be terribly vicious, whether he takes the form of a man, a wild boar, or something else entirely. Slowly, he filled his lungs with the briny air. Even so, your bravery has inspired my own. While I won't be joining you myself at the Circle of Stones, I will do my very best to urge others, more capable of fighting, to be there. Thank you, my friend. I cocked my head. Don't even think about trying the dwarves now. With Urnalda's state of mind, any man or giant who enters her realm is just asking to be killed. The poet smiled wryly. Worry not. I'll try something easier, such as the great man-eating spider of the misted hills. Elusa? Finding her is just as dangerous. His eyes narrowed. Everything now is dangerous. Pensively, he worked his tongue. I should say something before we part, I know. Something profound, or at least poetic. Something befitting a bard. He sighed. Can't think of anything, though. I told you I wasn't very good with endings. Doing his best to smile, he released my arm. Then he drew up the hood of his heavy cloak, throwing his face into shadow, all but the very tip of his nose. Turning, he strode through the stand of dead trees, a dark shape amidst their white trunks. He continued over the floodplains, his boots crunching on the hardened turf and brittle grass. Standing in the lee of the dune, I watched him go, wondering whether we would ever meet again. When his cloaked figure finally disappeared, I started gathering driftwood, enough to keep the fire burning through the night. The winter sun would soon be gone, and with it, whatever meagre warmth came from its rays. As the blue overhead deepened into purple, the colour of wild grapes, I ate the remains of our porridge and honeycomb. In time, darkness flowed across the land like the tide of a shadowy sea. My thoughts turned to the dead trees, and I contemplated how to bind them together in a seaworthy craft. Strands of kelp might work, or some of the dried vines I'd seen while crossing the floodplains. The size of the raft, of course, would depend on the number of children it would need to carry. If Shim did well, despite so little time, he might be able to find thirty, maybe thirty-five. Even for a large raft, that would be a full load. Yet the thought of saving that many lives, that many seeds, made me all the more determined to try. A new realization hit me. If I succeeded in protecting those children from Slayer, perhaps they would also be safe from Rita Gower. Might the curtain of spells that hid the island be enough to keep its shores, and anyone there, out of the warlord's grasp, even if he did prevail on winter's longest night? The moon, deep red rose into the darkened sky, resembling a swollen, angry eye. Behind the row of dunes, the water birds that had settled on the shore grew quieter. I listened to their occasional cries and the surging waves for quite some time, ever mindful that only four days remained before the longest night. At last I drifted into a fitful sleep. Not long after dawn's first rosy rays touched the top of my dune, I awoke. Though I couldn't be sure, I thought I heard a rhythmic rumbling in the distance. Grabbing my staff, I scurried up the sandy slope. 
When I reached the ridge, I realized that the congregation of seabirds had swollen to enormous size. Thousands of them milled and chattered, filling the entire beach and shallows right up to the edge of the rolling wall of mist. I saw pelicans and gulls, cormorants and kittiwakes, long-legged cranes and grey-necked swans, as well as ducks, herons, gannets, and many more kinds I could not name. Some marched around squawking or honking, some flapped their wings or danced vigorously. Some stood aloof on one leg, paying no heed to the tumult surrounding them. As the morning light swelled, so did the birds' raucous noise-making. At the same time, the distant rumbling also grew louder, enough that some of the birds at the edges of the crowd started to take notice. In groups of three or four, they lifted off and circled through the folds of mist, wings spread wide, trumpeting loudly to their companions. Not until the ground actually started to shake, however, did most of them take to the air. Then, by the hundreds, they took off, wings whooshing in unison. I stood atop the dune, drenched in golden light, watching the awesome scene unfold. Higher and higher rose the mass of birds, a great spiral of airborne bodies darkening the sky. Rhea's dreamlike words, spoken at the stargazing stone, came back to me. Imagine taking time to rise above the lands below, your spirit along with your body. Now, viewing these winged creatures ascending into the sky, I understood her words in a whole new way. Here was freedom, true freedom, as pure as I'd felt in my dreams of flying but more tangible, more real. I still longed for the speed and directness of leaping, of course, but physical flight offered something more than that, a fullness of feeling, a grandness of motion, an endless soaring of the senses. The spiraling cloud of birds angled eastward and began pouring toward the rising sun. I watched them depart, fading into the shredding light. Their tumultuous cries, too, began to fade, blending into a single melancholic chord that echoed across the shore. As trails of mist arose, obscuring the last of them, I felt I was watching not a vast flock of birds, but my beloved homeland itself slipping away. Finkyra was vanishing, no less than these creatures— its colourful scenes and richly varied sounds were disappearing, no less than their own. An instant later, they were gone. I stood above the beach, so recently charged with life, now utterly empty. Everything was quiet but for the pulsing of the sea, and the rhythmic rumble steadily growing. Spinning around, I gazed past the dead trees to the wide floodplain beyond, before long, a great shaggy head appeared on the horizon. With each new rumbling step that rocked the ground, the head grew larger. Soon I spied the red flames of Shim's eyes above his bulbous nose, along with his immense neck, brawny shoulders, and massive chest. In his hands, he held a wide-brimmed hat made from woven branches, while on his chest hung a vest infinitely bigger than my own. Leaning on my staff for balance, I peered at him closely. My brow knitted, for I could see no children. None at all. A feeling of dread swelled in my chest. Something had gone wrong with the plan. Seriously wrong. I gasped, seeing a subtle movement inside the bowl of the hat. Heads! Tiny heads! Lots and lots of them! More than I would ever have predicted! Why, there must have been at least seventy or eighty. Shim had, indeed, done his job well. Then my wave of relief vanished. There were too many children for one raft. I looked over at the straight trunks of the whitened trees, counting them. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Enough, perhaps, to build a very large vessel, one that might just hold everyone. Could I control it, though, guide it through the spells? My attention turned back to Shim. As he came nearer, 
his feet slamming against the ground, I could make out the faces of some of his passengers. There were bright-eyed ones, eager ones, doubtful ones, and several very sleepy ones. One little girl, wearing her hair in two braids that stuck out sideways from her head, sat on the shoulders of a boy with a chin so slender he reminded me vaguely of Halia. Both of them were pointing at the sky, in the direction of the departing birds, probably still visible from their higher vantage point. I searched the sea of faces for Lu, but with no success. Perhaps he was standing behind someone else, or even sleeping down inside the bowl. Still, I did recognize one lad, who was wriggling out of the hat onto Shim's thumb, the boy whose life I'd managed to spare in the goat pen of Ker Dalek. Another girl was seated on the brim of the hat, grasping one of the branches beside her for support. Sunlight streaming through her long brown hair, she watched the coils of mist rising from the shore, her face full of awe. In a few more thunderous strides, Shim reached the dunes. I barely kept my balance as powerful tremors coursed through the sand. Just before the dead trees, he stopped, planting his bare feet on the ground. As always, his sheer size amazed me. His ankle, thick with hair, reached nearly halfway up the dune. Well done, Shim! I called up to him. Beneath his gargantuan nose, the giant's lips parted. You asked me to do some crazily things before, Smerlin, but this is the craziest. He released a bellowing yawn, the force of which knocked over several of the children in the hat. I is so sleepily, after walkings for two nights, trying to find all the orphanly kids. Some in villages, some in mountains, some by roads. It wasn't easily. And somely times they is scrapping with each other's, pulling out hairs and ripping clothes. Then, for mostly of the night, they wants me to sing and tells them stories. Now... I really needs to rest, sleepily, definitely, absolutely. Many of the children, some of whom were giggling hysterically from being blown over by Shim's yawn, piped up. Their voices rang across the dunes, as discordant as the departed seabirds. No sleeping, Master Shim. We want some more bumpy rides. Sing some more, Shimmy. Sing us your longest song, please. Hey, hey, how'd you get to be so big and fat like? Did you eat a whole big mountain for brekkie fast? <laughs> yeah, after that mountain, now you need to drink up the sea to wash it all down. Yeah, then you'd make a great big waterfall. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. At that, a deeper voice called from the rear of the hat. Now, children, we don't need... It's all right, don't worry. The waterfall won't spray you. Gales of wild laughter followed but my attention was focused on the source of the deeper voice. My mother. So, she had come too. In the midst of the joyous chaos surrounding her, Elaine looked at me with a sparkle of genuine amusement in her eyes. Shim, for his part, stifled another yawn and started to lower the hat. Carefully, he placed it on the sandy shore between the braid of kelp that marked high tide and the base of the dunes. Oh, please, please, Master Shim, cried the girl with the two horizontal braids. No older than three, she was now seated on the brim of the hat, her legs swinging freely. Don't put us down yet. Fly us like them birdies was flying before. Shim bent down to her so that his lumpy nose pressed against the sand beneath the brim, don't be worried, little one. I'll give you another ride some time soon. 
she gazed at him wide-eyed. Really, will you, Master Shim? Of course, you sweetly girl. She crawled across the meshed willow branches of the brim until her face was right next to Shim's. Timidly, she leaned forward, then planted a kiss on his massive cheek. The giant's face, always ruddy, reddened more deeply, and for the first time in quite a while, he smiled, his wide lips wrapping around his face. By the time I trotted down to them, other children had already started scrambling over the edge of the hat. Oblivious to the chill air, several of the older ones started climbing up the dunes, rolling in the sand, or running off to explore the beach. A few stayed around to help me with the smaller children, coaxing them to jump into our waiting arms or carrying them if they were too cold to walk. Shim grabbed by their feet a pair of boys who had been hitting each other, holding them upside down for a moment while they squealed and squirmed in protest. Finally. When they'd calmed a bit, he laid them down on the sand. At the same time, my shadow emerged from the darkness behind Shim's vest. With an unmistakable air of smugness, it slid down the seam, through a buttonhole, and leapt to the ground. I was about to remind it that its vacation, while earned, hadn't begun yet, when my attention was diverted by a lanky girl about ten years old. She was boldly climbing out of the gap between Shim's ear and his temple, catching hold of a lock of his hair as if it were a rope. She swung from it and dropped to the ground before taking off down the beach. That girl Medba reminds me of your sister. I spun around to face my mother. Her hair was tangled, her blue robe soiled, and she looked almost as sleepy as Shim. But her face glowed bright as she tousled the hair of the young boy beside her. "Lou!" I exclaimed, giving his woolen scarf a playful tug. He looked up at me, his lone ear catching the sunlight through his curls. "I'll be much glad to see ye, Master Merlin." "And I, you, my friend." He beamed at me, showing the gap where his front teeth would some day appear. I turned back to a len of the sapphire eyes. So. I said through my grin, "You couldn't resist a chance to escape from that village." "Certainly not," she declared, her own mouth curling in a grin. But much as I dearly loved the place, somebody had to help Shim take care of all these children. Glancing at the figures scampering down the beach, splashing in the tide pools, kicking sand at each other, and jumping in and out of the hat, I had to agree. I'm sure Shim was glad to see you, as am I. We embraced, and I felt her patting my back through the astral vest she had given me. As we separated, she scrutinized me carefully, her brow wrinkling with concern. You've had some troubles, haven't you? Oh, I said as casually as possible, a few here and there. Right now, though, my challenge is how to build a vessel big enough to hold everyone. Why not ask Ria? She's always brimming with ideas. Her eyes swept over the dune, then back to me. Where is she, anyway? She's, ah,、uh, gone a different way, riding iron, which you know she loves to do. My mother scowled. She's not riding for pleasure. No. I admitted, feeling the weight of her gaze. She's fine, though. Believe me. She shook her head sadly. I don't believe you, Merlin. None of us are fine. What with all that's happened. Wait now. I waved my staff at the children spreading out along the beach. They are, and what's more important, for a brief moment at least, they're safe, free from the threat of that sword-armed scourge. Who's probably still searching for me near the place we last fought, far away from here? Still, my son, he's bound to find out where we are. Then the children, and you, will be in danger again. Eventually, yes, but I have a plan that, if it works, would keep them safe forever. I just need to. Suddenly, I felt something tug on my satchel. I whirled around to find Lou withdrawing his hand.
a guilty grin on his face. No harm, Master Merlin. I'd just be, well, curious about your bag. You mean what's in it? Well, yes, Master Merlin. I couldn't help but feel amused, since sneaking a peek into someone's satchel was just the kind of thing I'd have done at his age. Elaine's expression, too, had softened. No doubt she was thinking something similar. With dramatic tones, I proclaimed, Behold, young man, I shall grant your wish. View now the world-famous, roundly acclaimed, triply enchanted Magic Feather. Magic Feather, he repeated sceptically. Delicately, I lifted the satchel's leather flap, holding my breath in mock anticipation. Silently, I summoned the required powers, bidding them to follow my will. As the air above the satchel started to quiver, Lou gasped. Slowly, very slowly, Trouble's feather rose upward. The boy drew back, standing next to Elaine, his back pressed against her thigh, while the feather floated higher. Lou stared in amazement as the feather rose higher, drifting lazily toward him. Like a fluffy butterfly, it floated, spinning past his chest, over his shoulder, and along the length of his arm. It hovered, twirling before his face. Suddenly, it darted closer, tickling his nostrils. The boy laughed, swatting the feather away. He tried to catch it, even as the feather spun behind my mother. Eagerly, he swung around to reach it. As he did so, he knocked his head into her side, bashing the scabbed remains of his ear. He yowled in pain, covering his wound with his hand. Elaine bent down and stroked his head with compassion, whispering softly as she did so. But he continued to whimper painfully. Oh, Lou, I'm so sorry, I offered, steering the feather back into my pouch. That was a foolish, clumsy idea. After a moment, he turned to me, a thin trickle of blood running down from his ear. Nay, Master Merlin, he said weakly. I likes your idea very much. I be the clumsian, banging me noggin like that. I started to speak when Shim kneeled beside us, flattening a spur of the dune and a jumble of firewood with his great knee. He looked down on us glumly. I is sorry, Merlin, but I had some badly news. I groaned. What now? The giant's face contorted, twisting his oversized nose. Hardly as I tried, I couldn't convince any other giants to come to the battle. Not even Jingba, my oldest friend. When I tells him about Rita Gower and all, he just laughs at me and says I is full of exaggeratingliness. The report made me wince. That's terrible. Without at least some of the giants, we won't stand a chance. I is sorry, verily sorry. Mainly I will try them again after I takes the nap I is longingly for. He stretched his jaws with another yawn. And if that doesn't work, I tries the dwarves. If I can just find Urnalda, maybe I can convince her to help. No, Shim, I declared, recalling her death threat. You mustn't. She has set a... There you are, you cowardly runt of a wizard, boomed a voice from atop the dune. I spun around, though I already knew who was hailing me, yes, and with every particle of my body. It was the person I least wanted to see, the person I had no idea how to fight. Slayer. Chapter 22 Attack The warrior stood atop the dune, poised for battle. Sunlight glinted off his breastplate, and from the deadly sword blades attached to his shoulders. 
From behind his skull mask, his coarse laughter roared. Then, with the edge of one of his swords, he lifted the mask slightly, not enough to reveal his face, but enough to spit on the sand at his feet. You fled me before, runt wizard. This time, by the spirits, you won't escape. It's you who won't escape, I flung back, jabbing my staff into the sand of the beach. Looking up the slope at Slayer, my mind raced. He was here. Somehow he must have discovered my plan, and now that plan was ruined. No. Worse. Now that the children were gathered all in one place, they were in far greater danger than before. I'd done this madman a favor, and I couldn't possibly stop him if he turned all my own magic against me. Come, prove your brave words, he shot back. Come up here and fight to the death. By my side, Lou shrank back into my mother's arms. He trembled all over, the blood drained from his face. He released the urgent, heart-rending pew of a cornered animal. Further down the beach and in the shallows, other children stopped splashing in the tide pools, forming shapes in the sand, collecting colorful shells, or swinging from the brim of Shim's hat. As one, they turned to find out what was wrong. Several of them, seeing the terrible warrior with the face of a skull, froze in their tracks, standing as rigid as barnacles on sea-splattered rocks. Others started running away, kicking wet sand in all directions. A few even plunged into the rolling wall of mist that lined the shore, obscuring the sea beyond. Well, boomed my foe, are you no braver than that squealing boy beside you? Shim gave a thunderous growl. He rose from the kneeling position, blocking out the sun with his massive frame, you is the unbravely one, he bellowed, his voice blowing the remaining leaves off a linden tree at the base of the dune. I'll squash you like a tiny leaf bug. No, wait, I commanded, lifting my staff. He has strange magic, Shim, powerfully strange. Leave him to me while you round up the children. Get them all safely away, however you can. No, Merlin, implored my mother. Don't fight him. I must. Now go, both of you, get the children. The giant frowned. I surely hope you knows what you is doing, Merlin. So do I, seconded my mother, shielding Clu with the folds of her robe. Waving them away, I turned back to Slayer. You are a coward, I called trying to gain some time for them to gather the children. Why don't you show your face behind that mask? He seemed to hesitate, then slowly raised his bladed arms above his head. He stood there, a terrible silhouette against the sky, light glinting along the edges of his swords. For you, runt wizard, this is my true face, the face of death. With that, he stormed down from the crest of the dune. Slashing his blades, he ran straight at me, cursing as his boots dug into the sand. Now I had no choice but to fight him. In just a few seconds, he'd reach me. How, though, to fight? All my wiles were turned back on me. Then an idea suddenly struck. If I resisted using any magic, then he couldn't throw my power back. Yet that meant I must rely on brute strength alone, and that was a battle he surely would win. Just before he reached me, I flung my staff aside and hurled myself bodily at his legs. The force of my charge sent him sprawling over me. Both of us tumbled down to the beach, throwing sand in the air. No sooner did I scramble to my feet than he did the same. Roaring like a wrathful boar, he lunged at me, slicing with his swords. Rather than draw my own blade, I waited until the last possible instant, then stepped aside. Slayer plunged past me, rolling into a tide pool. Seawater, kelp, and gull feathers sprayed us both. Rising again, he stumbled, 
landing on a large orange conch shell, crushing it to bits under his weight. Immediately he charged again. With a stream of curses, he slashed his blades, barely missing my chest as I fainted one way and dodged the other. Huffing for breath, I faced him once more. Sooner or later I knew one of his swords would strike its target. I glanced over my shoulder to see Shim far down the beach, herding all the children behind the dunes. His pounding footsteps, like their cries, were swiftly retreating. Before long, they, at least, would be out of danger. Again he charged, flailing his deadly arms. Once more I escaped, leaping aside and turning a somersault on the sand. This time, though, when I stood and faced him, he made no move to attack. You're even more afraid than I recall, he snarled, panting hoarsely. Why do you run from me? No magic left? Plenty, I retorted, slowly circling him on the beach. I just don't need it to fight you. Then fight me, whelp! He lunged again. Just as I spun away, though, he halted himself. Seeing this, I tried to stop, but my foot caught on a twisted piece of driftwood. I tumbled onto the wet sand, rolling over on my back. Right above me stood Slayer, chortling in satisfaction. Behind him, a steep-sided dune rose off the beach like a sheer cliff, casting its dark shadow on both of us. No time to fight now, you runt wizard. He raised both of his blades, ready to skewer me. Just to die. He planted his feet. I saw the muscles under his breastplate flex. The twin swords lifted high, their gruesome edges flashing in the sun. No! cried another voice. Elaine, hurling herself on the sand at Slayer's feet, she placed herself between us. She threw back her head and glared up at him fearlessly. Don't you dare harm my son! Slayer guffawed. Only after I deal with you, woman! Under his breath, he added, How very fitting! He started to bring down his swords. As bright as streaks of light, they shone against the darkened dune behind him. In that brief instant, I knew I had no choice but to call on my magical powers. No other way to stop him. But I also knew that any magic would be thrust back at me. Or worse, at Elaine. My mind reeled. There must be another way. The swords swept through the air. I saw them plunging toward my mother. My rage at last boiled over, and I was about to form a fireball in my hand. Just then, the blurred figure of a man leapt off the top of the dune. With a ferocious shout, the man, wearing a hooded cloak, smashed into Slayer, knocking him to the ground. Bellowing with rage, Slayer struck out, stabbing the cloaked figure with his swords. He slashed at the man's chest, arms and legs in a brutal frenzy. Blood splattered the beach. All of a sudden, the sky darkened. I looked up to see Shim's immense form stepping over the dune from behind. His bare foot slammed down onto the sand. Before Slayer could move, the giant's huge hand reached down and grasped him by the middle, pinning his murderous blades to his sides. Although the warrior struggled so hard to break free that his armor seemed ready to burst, he couldn't budge. Shim lifted him higher, glowering at him with enormous eyes. Then the giant roared angrily, with such force that the great wall of mist shuddered, thinned, and pulled some ways back from the shore. Shim reared back and hurled the warrior straight through the mist and far out to sea. So far, that we heard no splash. The hulking form bent over me. Is you all right, Lee, Merlin? Thanks to you, old friend. I clambered to my feet. You and... My words faded away. I saw Elaine, her back to me, kneeling over the heroic figure. Although her back obscured the man's face, I recognized the cloak. 
It belonged to Capre. My insides wrenched at the sight. Capre, my mentor, my friend, lying there on the sand, dying. I stumbled over to join my mother, who was holding his hand, sobbing quietly. Then my heart froze. The hood of the cloak had fallen back, revealing his face. It wasn't Capre, after all. Instead of the face I knew so well, I viewed a thick black beard, a jutting jaw, and eyes as dark as my own. No, there could be no doubt. It was Stangmar. Though blood soaked his chest, staining the sand, he lifted his head slightly, uttering a single word. Ellen! She turned to him, still holding his limp hand. I am here, with you. Ellen, he repeated, his voice raspy. I had to find you, had to t tell you. She leaned closer. Tell me what? He squinted, as if his eyes were having trouble focusing. I have done wrong. So much wrong to this world, to so many, but most of all, to you. Please, she said softly, don't try to speak. For an instant, his eyes flashed angrily, a reminder of the ruthless king he once was. I must speak before... Again, he tried lifting his head, but it fell back to the wet sand. Weakly... He closed his fingers around hers. Ellen. Yes? Please, forgive me. She brought his hand to her lips and kissed it. Her soulful eyes gazed at his. I forgive you. A new quietness seemed to flow over his face, moving like one of the waves sweeping through the shallows. His mouth softened, his brow relaxed. Then, slowly, his head turned to me. I could see by his eyes that he was seeking my forgiveness as well, but whether from weakness or from stubbornness, he could not bring himself to ask. Nor could I bring myself to answer. For a long moment, we stared wordlessly at each other. A sudden spasm shot through him, arching his back. With a final groan, he swung his head back to Elaine, fixing his eyes on her. Then he closed them forever. Chapter 23 The Vessel Gently Elaine laid Stangmar's hand upon his bloody chest. With tear-stained cheeks, she peered at me. Her tone, full of grief as well as rebuke, she said, You could have forgiven him. My boots twisted uneasily in the sand. No, I replied, not after everything he did. She merely gazed at me, sorrowfully. I turned away, heading down the beach, my boots dragged across numerous shells, bright with colours, but I paid no heed. In the distance I could see Shim's woven hat, its lower edge lapped by waves. Already some of the children had returned. A few stood gawking at the corpse of Stangmar. Others climbed the dunes or waded in the shallows. Moving past them, I trudged along the shoreline. Noticing my shadow alongside me, I snapped, "'Where were you in that battle?' Some help you were. The shadow stopped walking, separating its feet from my own. I could almost feel its glare. No, I declared. I am not going to apologize. Sure, you do just fine on the easier tasks, like finding a giant. But when it comes down to something really risky, involving life or death, where are you? The shadow gave me a defiant shake of its head. All right, then, I ranted. You just do that. Go away, as far as you like, and I hope you never come back. 
the dark shape on the sand waved its arms wildly. Then it turned and stalked off down the beach. I watched it move away, certain it would return before long, ready to behave better. My stomach churned. What if it didn't, though? I glanced down at the empty sand by my feet, feeling strangely bereft. I almost called to the shadow before it disappeared among the dunes, but no words came. You is angrily, Merlin. I can tells. I looked up to see Shim's oversized nose dangling over me. Yes, I am. At that sword-armed menace, at Stangmar, at my shadow. I paused, swallowing. And most of all, at myself. Better to be angrily at that swordly warrior, advised the giant. Gingerly, he licked the palm of his great hand. If he wasn't so cuttingly sharp, I'd have squeezed him into stew balls. After another lick, he added, But I guess as he doesn't bother you for a while, since I throws him so far out to seas. You did well, Shim. Even if he survived, you certainly got rid of him for now. I wishes I'd gotten rid of him for Everly. He's muchly dangerous. Even with his bladely arms, I wages he can still swims. He might come back here to kill you and the tinyly childrens in another couple of dailies. By then we'll be gone, I declared, cutting him off. You see, Shim, I have a plan. My gaze slid to the highest of the dunes, where I had watched the rising spiral of seabirds at dawn. Behind the dune, the very tops of the dead trees protruded slightly, looking like white hairs growing out of the sand. If it works, that plan will keep the children out of Slayer's reach, and maybe also Rita Gower's forever. But I'll need your help to do it. The giant straightened, wobbling slightly as he yawned. I get the feeling I won't be getting my nap for a while. Just a little while, I assured him. I turned to the wall of mist, behind which the waves sloshed and pounded without end, and chewed my lip thoughtfully. The mystery of Slayer's identity still tormented me. And why did he say, just when he was about to strike Elen, that her death would be truly fitting? Shim bent lower again. What is you thinking, Smerlin? Oh, I was just wishing I'd removed his mask before you threw him out to sea. Me too's, came the reply, followed by another enormous yawn. Now, tell me this plan before I fall asleepily. And so I did. Taking Shim over to the trees, I explained that we needed a raft large enough to hold all the children, eighty-three, according to his count, plus Elen and myself. He seemed sceptical, especially when I told him that I planned to guide the vessel, by my own magic, through a deadly barrier of spells. Even so, he set right to the task. Wrapping his arms around the trunk of the nearest tree, he uprooted it with a single great heave, showering us both with sand and broken branches. For the next several hours, the two of us labored, hauling trees, removing their roots and branches, and arranging the trunks side by side on the beach. Sand and flecks of bark got in my mouth, eyes, and hair. Yet, despite all the grit and the aches in my back and upper arms, the raft began to take shape. The trunks fit together nicely when placed so that the thicker end of one lay next to the thinner end of another. And by working some of the larger limbs into any gaps, I made the fit even tighter. I felt increasingly convinced that our vessel would indeed hold us all, and be ready to sail by the next morning. As we worked, we were flanked by a large group of children who sat on the dunes watching our progress. Clue did more than watch, however— as did the athletic girl Medba, 
and a few of the older youths. They helped me trim the branches, whacking at them with shafts of driftwood, and also hauled off the debris. When the trimming was done, I asked them to round up some onlookers for another task. Before long, I had two teams, one led by Hlu and one by Medba, scouring the beach for the supple strands of kelp that I needed to bind the logs together. By late afternoon, the job was nearly done, as bronze hues dappled the dunes and shadows started to lengthen. I stretched my stiff back and surveyed the vessel. It looked quite seaworthy, thanks to the sturdiness of the logs. All that remained was to secure them with kelp and push off. Tempted though I was to finish everything now, before sunset, I knew that another, less satisfying task took precedence. Burying Stangmar. I'd promised my mother we would do it by nightfall, and the light was steadily dimming. Besides, I could see from her solemn pacing along the beach that she was ready. The raft's completion would have to wait until tomorrow. Calling Clue to my side, I asked him to build a bonfire for warmth, using all the scraps from the trees, as well as any driftwood he could find. Clearly delighted, he jogged off, kindling in hand. I then turned to Medba and asked her to take her team and dig up as many mussels as they could find in the wet sand by the shallows. Roasted mussels, she agreed, would make a fine meal. Then she told me something else. In the bowl of the giant's hat were generous supplies of oat cakes, bread loaves, dried fruit, and caskets of cider contributed by some villagers while Shim was gathering the children. I told her to break out some of the cider, but to save the rest for later. My attention turned to the burial. Again, I asked for Shim's help, and with a single swipe of his hand, he dug a deep hole in the sand at the base of the dune where Stengmar had leapt to our aid. As my mother and I lowered the heavy, blood-stained body into the ground, I struggled with another, far greater weight, my own tortured feelings. How could he have expected me to forgive him? And yet, for all the pain she'd experienced, my mother had done so. Why then couldn't I? As I bent over Stangmar's grave, smoothing the last sand over the spot, Shim's enormous finger tapped me on the back. The force of the blow knocked me flat. I rolled over, spluttering sand, and gazed up at him. I is leaving now, Merlin. He pointed his arm, as hefty as one of the trees he had uprooted for the raft, toward the east. I shall seize you, though, soon. In just three more dailies at the Circle of Stones. Stay the night, Shim, I urged, using my sleeve to wipe some more sand off my tongue. You can leave in the morning when we do. No, he replied with a cavernous yawn. There's something I is wanting to do for a long time. His wide mouth twisted in a strange smile. A very long time. Assuming he meant his long-awaited chance to sleep, uninterrupted by children crawling all over him, I nodded. Good luck to you, my friend. Samely to you. He looked doubtfully at the nearly finished raft. You is still full of madness, Merlin. Always will be, I replied with a grin. Now... Don't forget your hat over there on the beach. Shim's massive head swayed from side to side. The children's love playing with it so much. He paused, watching a group of fifteen or twenty taking turns leaping off the brim into the shallows, splashing and shouting boisterously. I is happily leaving it here's. My grin broadened. They're going to miss you when you're gone. Oh, I already said goodbyes to mostly of them. He gave me a wink and lowered his voice to a gale force whisper. Anyways, I is leaving verily sneakingly, so quietly nobody's will notice. My eyebrows lifted, but he turned to go. 
he stepped over the dune, and his footstep started thundering across the floodplains. Several dozen children, seeing him go, raced to the top of the dunes, waving their arms and calling after him. They stayed there, shouting merrily, until the echoes of his lumbering strides had long vanished. As I stood, brushing some of the sand off my knees, a sudden thought made me gasp. What if Shim's goal was not to find a quiet spot to sleep, but to go to the dwarves' realm in search of Urnalda? Hours earlier, he'd mentioned trying to win her support, and my warning had been interrupted. He'd be walking right into her death trap. In a frenzy, I ran to the top of the nearest dune, stumbling in my haste. Breathlessly, I stood on the ridge, hoping to catch a glimpse of him, to warn him somehow. But I saw only a wide stretch of dried grasses and bog holes, tinted a dusky purple by the setting sun. Grinding my teeth, I kicked at the sand. If there was ever a time to fly, this was it. No, this was truly a time for leaping. That way I could travel to Shim in an instant, warn him, and be back here before anyone even knew I'd gone. Yet that was utterly impossible. I shook my head glumly. Tomorrow's voyage with the children, now that it was upon us, seemed almost as difficult. I turned around, studying the beach shot with shafts of crimson and purple. Girls and boys were everywhere, hurling stones at the shallows, digging themselves into the sand, frolicking on Shim's hat. Two boys had started to scuffle near the raft, and my mother was pulling them apart. Several children had gathered around Lou's bonfire, which was burning vigorously, sending up a tower of orange flames against the dark blue wall of mist beyond the shadows. No one on the beach, I knew, understood the risks of tomorrow's journey. But I did. And now, on its very eve, I felt a deepening pang of uncertainty. Perhaps the better course was to remain right here. It was likely Slayer had drowned. Or, if he hadn't, he'd surely need some time to recover before he could attack again. Could I take that risk, though? And what about the risk of Rita Gower himself attacking these children, if his invasion succeeded? I gazed at the wall of mist, which was transforming into another shape, a high, steep-sided mound. The island, perhaps? The dangers of going there couldn't be any worse than the dangers of staying. And they might well be less. Even assuming some trouble at the barrier of spells, the voyage shouldn't take us more than a day. Then... With the children safe, I'd have two days left to run as a deer to the battle with Rita Gower. Enough time. Barely. Brimming with doubts, I strode down the dune to the bonfire. I spied my mother and veered toward her. She was seated cross-legged on the sand, watching not the fire, but the place where we had laid Stangmar to rest. As I joined her, I followed the line of her gaze. Sparks floated upward dancing brightly, never quite reaching the grave before they were extinguished. I cleared my throat, and she turned to me. We studied each other, our faces lit by the wavering flames, for some time. I felt certain that she, like me, was thinking about the man who had affected our lives so profoundly, and yet who remained, even in death, such a mystery. The small girl with protruding braids, whose name I'd learned was Kuena, pranced over, chewing on a roasted mussel. She flopped down on the sand between my thighs. Do you mind, Master Merlin? I'm cold. I couldn't help but grin. No, Kuena, I don't mind. You can stay right here as long as you please. Thank you, Master Merlin. Even as I patted her shoulder, some instinct made me turn away from the fire toward the long line of dunes. Suddenly, I glimpsed a vague shape on the farthest dune, the one closest to the water's edge. The shape seemed to be moving toward us, but so slowly that it might have been just a stray curl of mist. Yet something told me this was not mist, but a man. A man who was creeping stealthily, like a cat stalking its prey. The light from the fire reflected dully on something metallic by his side, my heart slammed against my ribs. Slayer!
But how? I must have underestimated his strength and his hunger for revenge. He had returned. Frantically, I scanned the beach, looking for anywhere the children could conceivably hide. But there was no shelter anywhere other than the sea itself. If only we'd finished work on the raft, then we could sail off before he arrived. If only... Wait, there was a way. A vessel we might sail. It might work. Hurriedly, I scooped up Kuena and called to everyone. Come now, all of you, follow me. Seeing my mother's look of puzzlement, I said urgently, He's coming back. To Lou, I cried, Come, bring everyone, we're going to the hat. Down the beach we dashed, every last one of us, tripping over ourselves on the soggy sand to the great hat. The waters of high tide licked the willow branches around its base. I couldn't tell if it would hold together on the water, nor if it would even float. But it was our only chance. Slayer, most likely, had seen us leave the fire. He could be running along the base of the dunes right now, closing in on us fast. Shove, everyone! I shouted, leaning my shoulder against the hat's tightly woven branches. Children, large and small, did the same, as did Elaine. Voices grunted and groaned, feet dug into the sand, but the massive object wouldn't budge. Again! I shouted. All together! Backs and legs strained. One of the smaller children started sobbing. Then, at last, the whole hat jolted. It scraped along the sand, sliding over a rock-rimmed tide pool and into the shallows, toward the roving wall of mist that separated us from the sea. To my relief, the hat floated, its mesh of branches bobbing on the water. Like a troop of ants climbing into their mounded home, the children scaled the sides, slithered through gaps on the brim, and dropped down into the bowl. Older children helped younger ones. Medba lifted a frail-looking boy onto her back, hauled him to safety, then jumped back down to the water for another load. Meanwhile, I saw Lou carrying little Kuana up to the brim. As more children climbed inside, I pushed the vessel into deeper water so we wouldn't run aground. At last, all were aboard. Shreds of mist wrapped around my arms as I gave a final shove and leapt onto the hat. I scrambled higher, grabbing hold of the knobby branches. Suddenly, I heard heavy boots pounding across the sand. I was right. It was Slayer. Now he plunged into the shallows, his skull mask askew, leggings torn, and armor coated with wet sand. He waded swiftly toward us, slashing the air with his murderous blades. Come back here, you coward! Come back and fight! Clinging to the side of the hat, I pleaded to the deep, ever-churning powers of the sea. Deliver us, please. Take us away from this shore. Waves continued to surge, slapping the vessel, but with no greater strength than before. Slayer drew nearer and nearer. I could see his chin protruding from under his mask and hear the whistling of his blades. Then, without warning, heavy mist closed over the hat, cutting us off from the shore and from Slayer. I could see no sign of him through the impenetrable vapors, though I could still hear his cursing. As the mist thickened, that sound gave way to a slow, ceaseless rumbling, fathoms deep. The sea had accepted us. Part 3 Chapter 24 The Very Depths of the Sea Darkness spread over the evening sea and over our vessel. The great hat bobbed and swayed on the water, while the children, my mother and I, perched on its brim like a mass of gulls on a rocky ledge. Some, including me, dangled our legs over the edge of the brim. Others lay on their backs upon the knobby mesh of branches. Still others sought shelter from the briny breeze by climbing down into the recesses of the bow. I looked past all the anxious, awestruck faces and into the folds of mist surrounding us. Even probing with my second sight, I saw nothing but vapors swirling darkly, vast, 
impenetrable and as mysterious as the sea itself. Waves slapped against the side of the hat, making the tight weave of branches creak incessantly. I peered into a gap where some rebellious branches had pulled loose, exposing the interlocking layers of willow, ash, and hawthorn. A complex splicing of vines supported every bend and wrapped around every joint, while something like spider's silk reinforced the knots. Spruce resin, carefully applied, gave the outer branches an eerie gleam, as well as extra resilience. I shook my head, wondering how the burly fingers of giants could have crafted something so intricate as this hat. For a timeless moment I watched the dark waves. They surged and withdrew, surged and withdrew, in a pulsing rhythm I could feel as clearly as that of my own heart. The waves hissed and sloshed, seeming almost to speak, sounding out their watery words, pondering meanings both deeper and wider than I could imagine. Then, from somewhere inside myself, I felt a vague stirring, the same indescribable yearning I'd always felt in the presence of the sea. Whether it was the lingering touch of my mer ancestry, or a half-remembered dream from my childhood, I couldn't be sure. Yet it told me that, for now at least, we were safe, cradled by the whispering waves, and I knew, without knowing how, that the currents were bearing us westward along the coast, in the direction of the forgotten island. Someone nudged my shoulder. I lifted my head to find myself looking into eyes as blue as the sky after a summer rain. Alain smiled at me gently. Brushing some salty spray off her cheek, she sat down next to me, her legs dangling alongside mine. For a while, we simply sat there, our hair blowing in the misty breeze as the hat sailed along. Neither of us spoke a word, listening only to the sounds of lapping water and creaking branches. At last, gazing not at me but into the darkening mist, she spoke. Where are you taking us, my son? The sea, not me, is taking us. With Dogda's blessing, we should land by mid-morning. Land where? I listened to the continuous slapping of the waves. The forgotten island. She tensed for an instant, then relaxed. Turning, she faced me squarely. I have faith in you, my son. So do I, Master Merlin. I spun my head to see Clu crouching beside me, his curls fluttering in the wind. Come, join us, lad. I slid closer to Elen. There's a space right here. Moving with care so not to bump into me with his head, he sat down on the brim. Mist flowed over his bare feet, slipping between his toes. Giving me a wry grin, he said, I've never went riding on a hat afore. I chuckled. Nor have I. Makes me want to see everything, you know, the whole wide world and all the seas in between. One day you will, I'll wager. I patted his thigh. You're already quite the adventurer. Not likes you, Master Merlin. Oh, I'm sure you've already done some things I haven't. Glancing at his blackened stub of an ear, I wanted to add, and survived some things I haven't. Before you're done... You'll go to all the places you like. Maybe so, he replied, the wry gleam returning. But I won't know how to make a feather go flying around, tickling your nose. Both my mother and I laughed. You might well do that too, I said. Feeling my stomach churn, I waved toward the bowl of the hat. Do you think there's enough food down there for me to have some supper? Clue nodded vigorously. Twenty suppers, if you likes. He drew up his legs and started to crawl over to the bowl. Trying not to knock into any other children, not easy with all the swaying, he called, I'll bring you a loaf or two of bread, and maybe... Hey there, you one-eared oaf! An older boy with muscular arms and a jutting chin grabbed him roughly by the arm. Watch where you're going! You crunched me knuckles with your knee! He brandished a fist. 
me thinks I'll do just the same to your face. Lou tried to wriggle free, but couldn't escape. Sorry, Hervid, he blustered. I, I didn't see you. I, the bigger boy gave him a brutal shake. Then maybe you'll see this, he raised his fist. Or maybe I should give that old ear some more flattening. No, no, squealed Lou, doing his best to cover the tender side of his head. Hervid smacked, clearly enjoying his power. He drew back the fist when I seized him by the wrist. He struggled briefly, then seeing who was holding him, fell still. Even so, he glared at me angrily for spoiling his fun. My temples pounding, I commanded, Let him go. Oh, I wasn't really going to hurt him none. Let him go, I repeated through clenched teeth. The boy complied shoving Clue down hard against the spiky branches. Hearing Clue's whimper, I glowered. Herbert merely watched me with a sassy grin. My wrath swelled out of sympathy for Clue, and also something more. This bully, so rough and unrepentant, reminded me of Denatius, that scourge of my childhood. Denatius had treated me just the same way when I was no older than Clue and whenever Alain had tried to stop him, he'd shown the same insolence as Hervid was showing now. No one aboard this vessel treats someone like that, I said sternly. What are you going to do? he shot back. Throw me overboard? My fingers squeezed his wrist more tightly. Now that was a tempting idea. Of course, I wouldn't really do that, but I still wanted to punish him somehow. Maybe I could use the idea to frighten him a bit. Well, he said sassily, you're gonna do it. That's what you deserve, I retorted. Wait, Master Merlin. Clu touched my forearm. Don't fling him in the sea. I looked down at him, scowling. Why shouldn't I? Because, well, he's not so bad, really. No. Viewing Clue's earnest face, my mood softened slightly, though my grip did not. Hervid, meanwhile, watched Clue with a mixture of surprise and suspicion. I did step on top of his hand, Clue explained. And I figures, well, we're all together here, for a while anyway, so we might just as well try to get along. My eyebrows lifted. You're a rare one, lad. Finally, I let go of Hervid. And you're a lucky one. If Lou here hadn't spoken up, I might well have thrown you overboard. I bent low, so my face nearly touched his. But only after I'd turned you into a sea urchin, or maybe a jellyfish. Seeing his scepticism, I decided to emphasize the point. I took one of the hairs hanging over my brow and gave a sharp tug. Then, holding it in the palm of my hand... I uttered a simple spell. The hair sizzled, curled, and abruptly vanished. In its place lay the wet, formless body of a jellyfish. I held it, fingering its slimy mass, before flinging it over the edge into the waves. For the first time, Herbert's face showed traces of fear. His eyes widened, and he started to back away, crawling across the brim. I stroked my chin, pretending to muse aloud. Or maybe a shard of driftwood. No, no, too little character. What about a handful of sea scum floating on the water like a rotten fish? Yes, that's just the thing. Hervid retreated even faster, scurrying over to the far side of the hat. Again, Clue tapped my arm. In a whisper barely audible above the slapping waves, he asked, You'd really have done that to him? No, I answered with a wink. But he doesn't need to know that, does he? I placed my arm around his shoulder when a sudden lurch sent us both sprawling on the woven branches. Children shrieked, tumbling across the brim, thudding into one another. One boy pitched headlong into the bowl. My mother flew backward, knocked into me, then grasped a bowed branch just in time to keep from falling into the sea. Others weren't so lucky. 
I heard several cries that ended in splashes. The hat, while continuing to rock with the waves, seemed to have stopped moving over the water. Winds blew harshly, shredding the mist. The whole vessel began listening to one side, as if it was sinking. We've run aground, shouted Medba, adroitly seizing my staff, which was about to roll off the brim. Everyone into the bowl, I roared above the din. Right now! Turning to Medba, I took the staff with a grateful nod. Go see if you can help anyone who fell over, but be careful. I'll try to get us out of this. Before I could blink, she was off, sliding through a gap and scuttling down the side with the agility of a spider. I crawled to the edge and peered down into the darkness. Meanwhile, the hat tilted even more sharply. Leaning as far as I could without falling over, I searched the waves for some sign of whatever we had struck. Nothing but water. The hat tilted further, creaking ominously. I jammed my staff into a space between some branches, making a sturdy post rising up from the brim. Hooking my legs around the shaft, I hung my entire chest over the edge. Splashing waves drenched my face, stinging my sightless eyes, but my second sight continued to probe the depths. Something stirred beneath the surface, long and thin like a strand of kelp. But no, it moved too purposefully for kelp. Then, along its side, I glimpsed a row of quivering suction cups, glowing with their own greenish light. A tentacle! I could tell by its immense length and girth that it belonged to something big, far bigger than our vessel. Stretching out my arm, I sent a stream of water, concentrated to strike as hard as a spear, at the tentacle. Seawater sprayed in all directions— but the tentacle swiftly recoiled, pulling itself out of reach. At the same time, other serpentine limbs lifted out of the waves, entwining themselves with the branches. Glowing strangely, they pulled on the hat, tearing at the webbing, dragging us downward. The vessel listed precariously. From within the bowl I heard frightened screams. Drawing on all the power within me, I called to the great hat, Rise now, rise, O vessel of willow and vine. An errant pelican swooped past, brushing my back with its wingtip. Again I called, urging the hat with all the force I could muster. Rise now, up from the sea! More spray drenched me, chilling blood and bone. Suddenly I felt the vessel starting to vibrate. The vibrations grew swiftly stronger, loosening the grip of my legs on the staff. With a wrenching effort, I pulled myself back up onto the brim. At that instant, the quaking hat began to turn, spinning slowly in a circle. The rotations came faster and faster still. Buffeted by gusts of spray, I clung to the staff, trying to keep my balance. Then, without warning, the spinning ceased. A loud, extended slurping noise erupted from the water beneath us. The noise swelled steadily, ending with a sudden pop. At the same time, the entire hat lifted out of the water, creaking and snapping like a grove of trees writhing in a storm. Peering over the edge, I saw great streams of water cascading off the sides of the hat, pouring back into the sea. Our vessel hung in the air, just above the surface. More than a dozen tentacles stretched out of the depths, glistening with green light that rippled across the tops of the waves. The tentacles flexed, tugging, but the hat didn't budge. Weakened though I was from the strain of the spell, I threw whatever I could into keeping our position firm, muttering a new round of chants. A strange, raucous cry arose from the sea, half bellow, Huff hiss, and full of fury. The tentacles slowly unwound themselves from the branches, releasing us at last. In unison, the supple limbs slid back under the waves. Their menacing glow lingered briefly, hovering just beneath the surface, then also disappeared.
Exhausted, I rolled onto my back. As my breathing calmed, I listened to waves pulsing beneath the hat, the sound of a tranquil sea. Below, in the bowl, the children's voices had quieted. I could hear some of them climbing out to the brim again. Then I heard another sound, one that slapped me like a frigid wave. Help me! came a thin, wailing voice from somewhere below, near the surface of the water. Someone, please, help me! Summoning my strength, I crawled back to the edge of the brim. Anxiously, I scanned the dark waves. I saw no one, until I looked not at the water, but at the side of the hat itself. Clinging to the sopping branches, huddled and frail, was the figure of a small girl. Kuena. Swiftly, I slid through an opening between the layered boughs and clambered down to her. Prying her shivering body off the branches, I gathered her in one arm, holding her tight. With great care, I carried her back up the side, pushing her through the opening in the brim before following after. I peeled off my mother's vest, still warm even though it was soaked with spray, and wrapped it around her tiny body. She looked up at me, her eyes bloodshot but radiant. Thanks, Master Merlin, she whispered. I touched her nose gently with my finger. You're welcome, little one. Next time you want to go swimming, though, tell me first. Through her shivers, she nearly smiled. I carried her down into the bowl, gave her a drink of apple cider, then tucked her into a quiet corner where she could sleep. Returning to the surface, I released the hat from my spell, a process that took longer than expected. The reason had nothing to do with my chance, and everything to do with Medba's insistence on first climbing down to the bottom of the hat, though she claimed she wanted to make sure there was no serious damage to the weave of branches, I suspected she really just wanted to experience hanging upside down over the water. After she returned, her hair dripping wet, I released the spell. The great hat dropped into the sea with a resounding splash. Waves lapped against the sides, bearing us westward once again. For the rest of the evening, I sat on the brim, my knees drawn up to my chest for warmth. Though the thick mist hid the rising moon from view, I watched as silvery beams scattered through the vapours, and I promised myself, however long this night might last, to stay alert for any trouble, whether from another creature of the depths or from the barrier of spells that lay between us and our destination. I listened, beyond the rhythmic slapping of the waves, to the voice of my mother down inside the bowl of the hat. To any children not already asleep, she told one of her favorite tales about the winged horse Pegasus. It was one I knew well, for she had often sent me to sleep as a child with its vivid images. Great hooves trotting through the sky, starlit wings beating steadily, and a graceful form leaping from one constellation to the next. The story, I knew, came from that other world across the water, the place where my destiny seemed determined to call me. Yet, as I heard Elaine tell it on this particular night, under the shimmering blanket of mist that surrounded us, it seemed to be a story that belonged to Finkyra, just as I, in my heart of hearts, belonged to Finkyra. In time, the rocking waves did their work, and my mother's audience succumbed to slumber. Moments later, she climbed back onto the brim. She sat beside me, her warm shoulder touching my own. From the pocket of her robe, she pulled a small loaf of grainy bread. If I remember right, she said, you never got that supper you wanted. Thanks, I replied, tearing off a bite of crust. I chewed avidly, savoring the flavors of roasted oats and rich molasses. I'm almost as grateful for this as I am for hearing you tell Pegasus again. You're a powerful storyteller. Elaine shook her head, making her flowing hair sparkle with moonlight. No, it's you who was powerful, my son. What you did to free us from that beast was marvelous. Not really, I said with a sigh. All it took was a bit of elementary leaping 
nothing like what Tuatha could do. Now there was a true mage. He knew the art well, so well he could send himself anywhere he chose and get there an instant later. As usual, she read my unspoken thoughts, which is how you'd like to get us to the Forgotten Island. I nodded, staring into the mist as a swelling breeze flapped the sleeves of my tunic. I wondered what sort of spells Dogda had placed around the island, and whether I could possibly unravel them without knowing why he had put them there. The truth is, I said with a sigh, I really know so little. You have great powers, Merlin. I've seen them in you from the very start. Pensively, she observed me. As did your father. I bristled at the mention of him. She touched my cheek, turning my face toward hers. You don't know everything, but you needn't torment yourself about that. Neither did Tuatha, not even the healer from Galilee, someone you've heard me tell many stories about, knew everything. But do I know enough? That's the real question. I forced back the lump in my throat. Enough to do all I need to do, for all those children down there, and for everyone else besides. She drew a slow breath. Do you know what Tuatha said to me once about you? Half-heartedly, I replied, that I would be a wizard one day. Not just a wizard. Gently, she lowered her hand, placing it flat against my back, behind my heart. A wizard whose powers would spring from the very deepest sources, so deep you could change the course of the world forever. Hesitantly, I nodded. Maybe so, but which world did he mean? Mortal earth, where I'm supposed to go one day to deliver this sword? My fingers wrapped around the scabbard. Or our Finkaira, the world I long to save right here and now. She gazed at me with that look that seemed to see under my skin. That I don't know. What I can tell you, though, is this. Your grandfather said that one day your powers will have grown so strong that you will stir the very depths of the sea. We sat together a while longer feeling the cold wind off the waves. When she spoke again, it was to bid me good night. I'm going to check on the children now. Then I'd like a little sleep myself. With a thin smile, she added, I hope you'll be doing the same, Merlin. I merely nodded. After watching her go, I stretched my second sight outward. I followed the folds of mist, which thinned only rarely, to reveal a hint of coastline or an edge of rounded moon. Now and then I gazed at the mesh of woven branches streaked with silver beneath me. My thoughts lapped, like the waves, against the memories of my dearest friends. Rhea! How had she fared with the trees and the others? And Shim! Was he heading into a Urnalda's trap? I wondered about Kepre, probably searching for some way to rejoin Elen. Nothing would stop him, I knew, not even a wall of deadly spells, and I understood his feelings all the more, since I felt that way about someone else. If only I could be with her again soon. Despite my vow to stay alert, my head sagged lower. When at last I awoke, it was already too late. Chapter 25 the New Day I awoke to the crash of an enormous wave against the vessel's side. Water splashed the brim of the hat, soaking me completely and rolling me over with its force. Much of the wave sloshed down into the bowl, causing loud commotion from those below. Grasping my staff, I managed to stand. A pale golden light was filtering through the parting shreds of mist, sparkling on the churning crests. The light of dawn. In that first instant, I saw two things at once, both lit by the new morning light. A line of waves just ahead, rising strangely high, and beyond, a rugged little island with sheer cliffs of dark rock. Atop the island sat a jagged hill, 
glowing like a sunlit crown. Glancing to the rear, I could see, through the haze, the outline of Finkaira's western shore. Its own sheer cliffs rose steeply out of the frothing surf. I turned back to the crown of land ahead. So we were, indeed, approaching the forgotten island. But first, the waves. Less like a wall than like a jagged row of teeth, the line of waves rose vertically out of the sea. Between the tall spires of water, parallel rays of light lifted into the sky, arching high over the island, shielding it on all sides as well as from above. The bars of light shimmered ominously, quaking in the air. All the while they hummed a single eerie tone. Wherever they touched the ocean itself, wild waves crashed furiously. Some of those waves, like the one that had struck us, rushed outward, colliding with anything that happened to stray into their path. At that moment, another wave hit. Even larger than the first one, it slammed into our vessel like a gigantic hand. Children screamed as bodies rammed against one another inside the bowl. I tumbled over backward, crashing on the mesh of branches. My staff flew out of my hand and plunged into the sea. The hat tilted at a crazy angle, hurling me to the edge of the brim. Somehow I caught myself on a protruding knot of vines. Struggling to pull myself up again, I heard sharp creaking from the timbers nearby. Hastily, I crawled over to investigate. I could see that several layers of branches had snapped completely, while others were rapidly working loose. All at once, my section of the brim shuddered violently. Great seasons! It was breaking! Before I could do anything, the whole section sheared off and collapsed into the sea. I spun down into the whipping waves. Seconds later, I surfaced, gagging from all the water I'd swallowed. Right before me rose one of the shimmering bars of light, humming like a colossal swarm of bees. At its base, the water boiled violently. The great hat, I could see, had veered toward the spot. Already it was pitching in the froth of the maelstrom. Turn back, I willed the vessel. Turn back before... A wrenching groan arose from the hat as two powerful waves smashed it from opposite sides. A gaping hole opened just above the base, spewing twisted branches. Water started flooding in. I heard the children's shrieks above the din. With all my strength, I swam toward the collapsing craft. Another wave toppled over on me, thrusting me downward. Frigid water poured into my lungs. Gasping, I regained the surface, just in time to witness the final destruction of our vessel. Vines unraveled, waving in the air like angry snakes. Branches tore apart, sending countless shards into the air. One whole section slammed into a column of light and instantly burst into flames, showering the churning waters with sparks and fiery embers. Blazing resins, glowing orange, bubbled out of the joints and dribbled down into the sea. Great columns of steam rose upward, hissing noisily, wherever fire and water met. All around me, little heads bobbed and limbs flailed, grasping for floating bits of wood. Elen! I shouted. Clu! Kuena! But I couldn't find them. Beyond the roaring and crashing of waves and the ominous hum in the background, the sound that pierced me most deeply were the terrified screams, screams I knew I'd caused myself. Spotting a boy sinking nearby, I reached out to help him. His sand-colored curls floated on the water like a mesh of yellowing kelp. Grabbing hold of his locks, I lifted his head. It was Lou! Sputtering, he hugged my neck in panic, squeezing like a noose, so tight I couldn't breathe. As I twisted to break free, both of us sank beneath the surface. The boy released me, flailing wildly. I grabbed the shoulder of his tunic and hauled him upward, kicking furiously. But the surface seemed so far away, my arms so much heavier than before. 
My lungs ached for air. I struggled to swim, but felt myself sinking rather than rising. I couldn't lift Lou's body, nor even my own. My mind started darkening. From somewhere, I dimly heard my mother's words. One day you will stir the very depths of the sea. What bitter irony! The words rang in my memory, laughing raucously. Stir the very depths. From somewhere else, somewhere deeper, another memory arose. It was not a memory of thought, nor of the mind at all. Rather, this was a memory of the blood.